Hey everyone, welcome to Game Face, episode 255 on Sifted Games at Sifted.net. And we have what I think is the biggest game release of the year so far. We're going to discuss Resident Evil Village in depth on today's show. Alongside me to do that is Matthew Kyle. What's up, Matt? 255. If we were Pac-Man, we'd uh, be hitting a kill screen. <laughs> That's good, man, that you picked up on that. How's your week been? Um, okay. I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> Did you sleep all week? <laughs> um, no, I didn't sleep enough this week. That's the problem. Um, it's Resident Evil, Baldur's Gate um cleaning a lot of tax emails because that's coming up but uh you know keep it on keep nothing, it on nothing too exciting yeah still waiting for still waiting for like everybody else i know to finish the vaccination stuff yeah i really. get mine on saturday my second shot and i'm finally free <laughs> no, you got two more weeks Gotta yeah let those antibodies build up yeah but i'm just saying the responsibility part of it you know, as right. far as all the logistics and the coordination. Going, going to a weird hotel to be stabbed by someone <laughs> yeah. is over. Well, my wife got vaccinated at some shady CVS in the middle of, like, Taunton, <laughs> basically. So, <laughs> to me, the hotel seems like I'm at the Four Seasons compared to where she went. But she wanted a very specific vaccine, I mean, so they had the it The hotel there. seems like the Four Seasons is, is a statement, yes. <laughs> Uh, but I hope all you guys are getting vaccinated. I hope you guys are starting to feel how Matt and I are, where you're kind of seeing more than the light at the end of the tunnel. The end of the tunnel is actually, like, right there. So hopefully you guys are all in the same boat and you're getting ready to go back to normal life. I know I'm really, really excited about it. Uh, we do have a big show for you guys today. We got, like, seven topics, I think, in today's show. But obviously, RE Village is the big game. Uh, one note is you may be expecting for us to talk about Hood uh, which is the asymmetrical multiplayer game based on Robin Hood. I did not get review code until this morning, unfortunately. So you have to put a pin in that one and uh, wait for next week for us to tackle that game. Uh, but it seems to be pretty good. Some of the initial reviews have been higher than I thought. So I'm kind of excited to check it out. Um, let's see. Housekeeping. What do we have got, got going on? Uh, this Saturday is the next live recording of Ask Shane Anything. It's already the second Saturday of the month. Um, as I've said before, it is the live recording is open to everyone who pledges $7 or more per month on our Patreon at patreon.com slash sifted. In fact, I'll run that graphic right now. Um, and uh, there will be a post. It's the, the stream starts at noon on Saturday, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, there will be a post to remind everybody up on our Patreon early in the morning. And then about 10 minutes before noon, Pacific. Uh, there will be another post that will be that will include all the Zoom call info for you guys to join the call. It's really a good time. We had a lot of fun doing it last time. We've only done it twice so far, but our audience built on the second one. Really hoping you guys can kind of put it on your calendar and show up. Uh, generally, we talk for around an hour, hour and a half ish. Uh, and as always, you can ask me anything you want. And then the archive will then be posted usually a couple of days later because there's a lot of post production that has to go on with that show now that it's live. Uh, but then it'll usually get posted for everybody else uh, a couple of days later on our Patreon and at sifted.net. Uh, so make sure you check that out. Uh, another thing, this Friday, the new episode of Three Night Weekend has a very special guest. We have Frank O'Connor on the show. Do you know who that is, Matt? Oh, yeah, Halo guy. Yeah. So Frank O'Connor has been... He started as the community manager for Halo back in, like, 2006 or something like that. And then he moved into, like, creative director slash community manager for Halo. He has been working on the Halo franchise for 17 years now. Uh, but he is the next guest on Three Night Weekend. Recorded the conversation yesterday. He's really busy right now, as you might imagine, because they're trying to wrap up Halo Infinite. So I had to get him when I could. And it shut Schreier up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I had to get him when I could. So we recorded it yesterday. The show will go live on Friday. That show also has a lot of production involved with it, believe it or not, um, even though it's just an audio-only show. Uh, and that'll be live Friday early, 
for our patrons, and then it'll go live on Monday for everyone else on our YouTube channel. Speaking of people who are watching our content for free on YouTube or listening to Game Face or any of our other shows for free on podcast services, it would be awesome if you could help us out. Um, we need every penny we can get to uh, keep creating our content and help our publication grow. If you want to help us, you can head to patreon.com slash sifted. Uh, and if you can't afford it, totally get it. You can still help us with Twitch Prime. Uh, if you're watching Game Face on YouTube, there are step-by-step instructions down in the description. You do have to link your accounts the first time you do it. After you do that, it's literally one click. And you have to re-up it every month. I really wish they would incorporate rolling subscriptions for that, but they won't. Uh, so you do have to go back every month and do it. It's a huge help to us. Uh, I do want to say you guys have been great the last couple months. Um, I can see an influx from our YouTube audience in our Twitch Prime numbers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please keep doing it. Again, once you've linked your accounts, it literally takes two seconds. You just go to twitch.tv slash siftedgames and click a button. And that's all you got to do. And you give us a free $2.50. It is huge for us to keep the show going, to keep Pactor Factor going, to keep the site going. We need the money. Uh, we really appreciate if you could take just a second to do that. If everybody who watched the show on YouTube did that, we'd be golden. So just to put it in perspective, you can make a huge difference for us, uh, our YouTube audience, and it costs you nothing, and it takes you a second. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and I think that's it for all the housekeeping for 255. We want to get into the show because we do have a lot of topics, and usually we save the biggest topic for the end of the show, which is obviously Resident Evil Village. But this week, we're giving you guys a special treat. I realize some of you guys can only show up for the beginning of the show. And eventually you may have to go leave and do something, or maybe you're going home from work or whatever. Uh, so we're hooking you guys up with Resident Evil Village right off the top today. Um, Matt, how far did you get in the game? Have you finished it by any chance? No, I think I'm like, I, I assume I'm halfway through because I'm right about to fight the second, uh, whatever you want, weirdo monster lord people. Yeah. You know, there's four of them and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm about to fight the second guy. You're, um, you're nowhere near halfway through. No? No, uh-uh. There's a lot more? Yeah. Well, actually... Because I heard it was pretty short. It is pretty short, but... So here's the thing. So maybe we should set up the story first. Um, it is a direct continuation of Resident Evil 7, which a lot of you guys may mm -hmm. remember was also available for PlayStation VR and playable in VR. This game is not. It is 2D only. Um, but it picks up basically right at the end of that. Ethan is living a domestic life with his wife, Mia, and their daughter, Rose, who is just an infant. Um, the other thing you may remember is at the end of Resident Evil 7, you're forced with a choice. You have, like, one vaccine, and you have to choose between Mia, who's your wife, and this other person who's helped you along the way. Well, they basically decided that saving Mia is the canon in the, in the overall plot of the game. So when you start, you're living the domestic life with Mia and your kid. Chris Redfield busts into your house with a bunch of soldiers, Kills Mia, steals Rose, and then you kind of black out. When you wake up, you are in, is it Romania, Matt? Yeah, it's in Romania. You are in Romania in this strange village wondering what the hell just happened. And that's how the whole thing kicks off. And very quickly, you're introduced to um, Lady Demesque, which is the, car the big tall lady that everyone's been freaking out about ever since uh, the game was first announced. And she's kind of the first henchman. But your main target in the game is, is not her. And I think maybe people have thought that, Matt, because of how much... Because, I, look, I don't blame Capcom for this because, look, they created a character that people immediately attach to. And it wasn't that Capcom was, like, egging people on to kind of become obsessed with Lady Demest, Demestricu, Demest, I don't know how they say it. Um, but Dimitrescu. Dimitrescu, yeah. Dimitrescu. Dim Dimitrescu. I can never get it right. Yeah. Um, and I just heard it like a thousand Everybody times. Everybody in the game says it a little different, too. They do. The, yeah, it depends on the accent you're using. <laughs> it's funny. Um, so anyway, she is not like the main villain of the game. Um, there is a, an overlord who is running sort of this group of henchmen, and there are four different henchmen. That's what Matt was alluding to at the beginning. There's Lady Damask. There's... What's the, the guy's name with the hammer? Heim? Heisenberg. Heisenberg. The, Why can't I not remember any of these names? <laughs> I don't know. Because they're not very memorable people. I guess. Um, the uh, Also, like, I just call him like like 
bargain bloodborne guy like <laughs> he, he like, does have a very similar like, aesthetic yeah he's um i mean I, I, no no points off for for taking inspiration visual inspiration from the best but uh he does look like a bloodborne character he does look like father gascoigne yeah uh it's it's uh uncanny at times so there's those two and then there's like a girl who's like been transformed into a doll and then there's this other thing this was a man that's been mutated into this like I don't even know how to describe it. It's like a living pimple almost. <laughs> He's like a fish man. He's supposed, it's yeah. like a, it's supposed to be like a Lovecraftian, like Innsmouth, like a merman thing. or something. I yeah, guess. yeah. He's supposed to be like a like a like a deep ones fish man thing. I think. Yeah. And so the structure of the game is essentially you take out those four henchmen one by one until you get to the big baddie. And when I first started playing it, the first of the henchmen that you take on is Lady Dimitrescu, and that took me about two and a half or three hours to get through her part. So I started doing the math, and I was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, you know, another two and a half, three hours for the next three. This game's going to be longer than people say it is. But, Matt, I think why your timing's getting thrown off, actually, is that the next two don't take anywhere near as long as, as the lady did. Mm-hmm. But then the fourth one takes at least as long or maybe longer than she did. And then there's a bunch of stuff after that, more than I expected. So that's not why you're not quite halfway there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, the game t- the game did end up taking me about 11 hours and 15 minutes to complete. Um, I had seen reports anywhere from 8 hours to 18 hours. I finished it in 11 hours, and I collected a lot. I didn't get like 100%, and there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. I, am being, I am being pretty meticulous about cl- uh, bluing out the map. Okay. Um, make um, sure you do that, Matt. Um, because one of my ma- ma- seriously, like before you go to a boss fight, if you can anticipate it, try to clean everything out. Because one of my yeah. biggest complaints about this game, and sometimes you can't tell that you're going to be in a boss fight and you're just screwed. But mm-hmm. um, one of my biggest complaints about this game is the level design and how you get cut off from parts of the game and you cannot go back. Mm. Um, there like are, once you fight a boss, like you can't go back to no, the. No, there's no place way to. They, yep, it's closed mm-hmm. off. You can even get back to like the building, and they will have put like a brick in the hole where you had crawled out of or whatever. Yeah. Like there's one section of the game where, and there are four of you've probably seen in the trailers. There are these like ball puzzles where you have a steel ball right. and you roll it through like this labyrinth until it drops down into a hole, and then you. Yeah, get I've a done ro- two of those, I think. Okay. Well, you get a re- you get a big reward for that. Like it's an yeah. item that you can sell for big time money. Well, I got the first three, and the fourth one. By then, I realized, oh my god, I need to collect stuff before I leave, or otherwise I'm not going to be able to get it. So I pretty much finished like the fourth labyrinth, so to speak. And I was like, okay, it's time for me to solve the ball puzzle now. I need to go back and find it. And I sc- I could not, as it turned out, I could not even, before I left there, go back and get the ball. There was no way to get back. The way that I had come out from where I missed the ball, they had put like a slab of concrete over the hole that I had crawled out of. And I could not get back and get it. So the way to do it is, as Matt just said, use the map a lot and look at the map a lot. And if something is blue, it means that you've taken everything out of the room. If a room is red, it means there's still something left in there. It doesn't tell you what is left in there. It could just be, mm-hmm. like, handgun bullets or whatever. But at least you know there's still something in there to collect yeah. or get. Yeah, and I started just, like, making sure a room's blue before I leave it. Because yep. in, in the castle, I did, you know, once I it got, gets to, you know, there's a point at which in the castle, it's very clear you are about to, you know, go for your final confrontation. And... So I was like, oh, well, I better go back and do it. But, you know, and you can get to everywhere in the castle right before the boss fight. Yep. But because of the events that happen, like the, the routes are different. You got to go all the way around this side and you got to go all the way around back. You, you can't go through the same way you went. Yep. So you have to, like, take some, like, shortcuts if you remember them. Like, so basically, it's, it's a lot more convenient <laughs> to just make sure you have everything turned blue before you leave a room, if at all possible. Agreed. Sometimes you need to go back with a different item or whatever. Like, you can't help that. But yeah, um, certainly if it's just like, you know, because a couple of them where it's like, okay, I, I didn't see this pile of rusted metal in the corner the first three times through here. So that was, I had to go back to go get it. So I'm, I'm being more meticulous about that now because it does seem like each area gives you enough. If you find everything, it seems to give you enough money to buy the Duke out of yeah, anything I, the, you might need. The economy in this game to me is completely shot. It, I finished the game. I think I had 300,000 lay unspent. 
um, because mm-hmm. they kept giving me so much money that I kept assuming there's going to be some big purchase that I need to make at the end of the game. There's going to be some super weapon that's going to make the final boss really easy to beat, or they're going to give me like some inventory upgrade that's going to cost like 200,000 lei or something like that. That never happened. Spend your lei. <laughs> I finished the game with a ton of it left, and I had the max um, inventory that I could have. In fact, I never ran into inventory issues in this game at all, Matt. Did you? No, it has, it hasn't been. I haven't been full yet. I never got to a place where I went to pick something up, and they're like, your inventory's full. There was one time where I had to go back and rearrange everything in my inventory mm-hmm. to make sure there was a block of open spaces big enough to fit the new weapon I just got in it. But otherwise, if you keep buying like the upgrades as they become available, you won't have any problem with inventory. And they're not that expensive because, again, the game just keeps giving you lay over and over and over again. And then if you kill enemies, if you kill a lot of enemies, that's where you get the big payouts because they'll drop like crystal skulls or whatever that are like worth 20, 30,000 lay. Um, just make sure you're picking everything up and you're killing as many enemies as you can. And the economy in this game eventually, in my opinion, does get broken. Um, I wish I had realized that I was going to the final showdown because I would have just I would have bought a lot more ammo um, and a lot more like pipe bombs and trip mines and things like that to make the final boss easier. Um, and I had a clue, but you know how Resident Evil is, Matt. Like you may think you're going to fight the big bad boss, and it's just like this mini boss or whatever. Yeah, I mean this game has a, a, a bit of a communication problem overall. Um, like especially early on, there was a couple things where like I reloaded the game because I'd wasted a bunch of ammo on a boss that you can't fight yet. You know, like there's a couple times where I was like, okay, so you need to tell me when I need to run and when I can actually fight. Like yep. I'm constantly running to this thing, like, okay, can I kill you this time? Or is, are you just like here to like waste my ammo? irritating? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's like, and it's like, you, can, you know, not that ammo is like hard to come by. Like they give you plenty for the most part. And you can craft it, so it's like you know you're always going to have enough. Like I've always, I'm always kind of like right on the right on the the edge of enough ammo. I've run out. Um, I ran out of ammo a bunch of times. Oh, by the way, I have finished. I finished the game. So, mm-hmm. um, it. I will say this. I like the ebb and flow of that stuff, though, because one thing mm-hmm. I'll say about this game is I do. It's not like this steady line where you're always like underpowered or you're always overpowered. It goes up and down. It's like a saw curve. Um, There are times where you feel like you're not prepared for what you're taking on. Um, There are times where you feel like you're just right for what's happening in the game. And then there are times where, you know, it's the exact opposite. And you just completely destroy someone. And I would argue that towards the end of the game, it did become maybe a little too easy. I generally like games' difficulty to ramp up as the game goes Mm -hmm. at least a little bit. There's a couple places where you're like, really? Nope. Nobody just did this? Yeah. (laughs) It's like... I realize that they don't have a lot of heavy firepower in that village, but like there's a, a couple of the things that seem really like powerful and it's like when you actually fight them, you're like, oh. Yeah, you that, drop them mm. with like three shotgun okay. shells or whatever. Yeah, you're like, wait a minute. Um, but I there's like. A lot, there's a bunch of weird things like that. It's, I don't know. It's. Uh, the difficulty is definitely yeah. uneven for sure. Mm. But overall, I would say it's too easy in general. It has been a little simple. Yeah, I would recommend. Um, like, there's up. like enemies I don't like fighting, but like more in the sense of like, like I don't like fighting the werewolves because they dodge too much. They're really and nimble. like, yeah. and I feel like I'm wasting bullets. Yep. Um, it's it's yeah, you know, it's just that kind of thing. And like that's not scary; it's just annoying. You know, it's it's, it's weird. Um, like I just have no patience with them. Like it's like the lichens are just sort of like, oh, you, like, I just wish I could hit them with the shotgun. It's <laughs> like shut up. Well, then sometimes you have to fight full on werewolves, like the big ones that mm-hmm. literally take a whole arsenal to drop, and they're just as nimble and fast as the rank and file lichens as well. Um, another criticism I would have of this game is there aren't enough enemy types. I I really thought yeah. the enemies that I saw at the beginning of the game. I'm like, okay, this is just for the castle. Um, and then when I go to fight the second henchman, there will be a new group of enemies to mm. fight there. And that's really not how the game works. No, like, you're, you're fighting those. Va- I mean, if you look at the files, there's like five enemy types, really. Literally, like five enemy types. And then there are a few mini bosses here and there. Not a ton, mm-hmm. but a few. And sometimes they're just kind of mutations on the rank and file enemies. They're like yeah. more heavily armored or they may have like a special weapon. 
uh, but they typically look a lot like the enemies that you've been fighting the whole time. So you have like a handful of enemy types, and then you have the four henchmen that you fight and like three mini bosses, and then Mother Miranda, which is the the lead baddie. And that's pretty much it as far as the enemies are concerned. I was really surprised by that, to be honest with you. Um, but I will say this. I really enjoyed the combat, like a lot. Um, Matt was talking about the Lycans and not liking fighting. I liked the Lycans. They presented like the biggest challenge in the game because they're really quick. They also seem to be the smartest. Um, they're really mm-hmm. good at figuring out when you're going to squeeze the trigger and ducking under and then running in and grabbing a hold of you. Um, and as you, if you've played any Resident Evil games, you know that this isn't like twitch shooting. This isn't you being really good with your reticle and like siding up enemies really quickly. It's really about you getting smart about the enemy animations and realizing what they do and how they sway. And how I play the game is I compute that. I'm like, okay, this is this enemy type. He's going to sway back and forth and rise on the left and rise a little lower on the right. And I just put my reticle and I just leave it. And I let the enemy sway into the reticle and then I squeeze the trigger. Like, I don't play Mm -hmm. this game like constantly trying to sight up the enemies other than getting it in the general vicinity I want it. Then I just let them like walk into the reticle and squeeze off the trigger. Um, in a lot I hit them with a shotgun, and when they fall over, I stab them until they die. Yeah, well, here's another thing pretty, I really that's like. That's pretty much how I roll with the, the minor enemies. <laughs> another thing I like about this compared to other Resident Evil games, and particularly the remakes that have come out recently, is that you know when enemies are dead. So I complained about this with both the RE2 and the RE3 remakes. You down an enemy... And then you'd walk by them, and they'd, like, grab you by the leg and bite you in the leg. Because there was no way to, like, double tap to tell if they were dead. Well, in this game, because they drop stuff, they drop, you know, items or lay when they die, you know when they're dead. As soon as that little icon mm-hmm. pops up, you know that you can walk past them, and they're not going to get, like, a cheap hit on you. They I like also that. generally dissolve. Yeah, eventually. Um, but when you're fighting a bunch of them, you don't have time to sit there and wait mm-hmm. and watch them dissolve, unfortunately. Um, so I really like that about the combat. I thought the guns felt great. Um... There is a pretty big upgrade system for the weapons. As you know, the the kind of portly dude, Duke, he is the vendor in the game. And I'll say this, Matt. He kind of gets developed into more of a character later on in the game. Instead mm-hmm. of just being a vendor, like, you learn. Before the game's over, you learn about him and, like, what, what his motivations are, where he's from. Um, but initially... <laughs> why, he's, why he's allowed to be in everybody's house. Right, yeah. Um, but he's the vendor, and you can go to him and you can just buy weapons outright. And as you progress through the game, more weapons come online in the store. Um, so what you see at the beginning, you're like, oh, there's just a shotgun and a pistol and a sniper rifle. Eventually, you get multiple versions of some guns. Like, you'll get a better shotgun. You'll get a better handgun. Matt, have you got to any of the dupes yet? And did you decide to go to the new weapon or stick with the old one and just upgrade the old one? Um, I haven't bought them yet. Okay. But I am definitely going to get the new shotgun. Yep, you should. Absolutely. So I got the new shotgun, and I kept the old handgun, and just kept maxing it out. Because the other thing yeah, too, well, is, I already have two hand. I have the starting handgun, which I've up, upgraded to the max, okay. um, which I'm fine with. And then I have the the Wesker's gun that yep. came with the pre order or whatever. And between those two, I feel like I do fine. Yeah, I never hardly even use Wesker's handgun to be honest with you. I just kept using the one I got at the beginning of the game, and the other thing too about upgrading. Until weapons, you upgrade the the one you get at the beginning of the game, it's a little stronger. But yeah. now it's basically useless to me. Yeah, if you do the math, you can kind of figure out which one is the better one to use throughout <laughs> the entirety of the game. Uh, the other thing about it, though, is as the game wears on, you new upgrade slots are unlocked for guns. So mm-hmm. when you first start, like the maximum you can upgrade the pistol you get at the beginning is like four slots in power. Eventually, it gets to like six or seven slots that you can upgrade. The So don't think that whatever you're seeing in the ratings for those guns, that's the most that they can go up. All guns unlock more levels of upgrade as you play through the game. Um, and then Duke is also the place where you go to sell all the items that you get. A word of caution when you're doing that. Look through your items before you sell them and look at how they're designated at the end. If they are designated as just valuable or really valuable, just sell them. If they say valuable slash combinable, do not sell them. Because if you find the other part that you can combine with that first part, you get buku money. And honestly, I think that's probably where the monetary system got out of whack for me. Once I figured that out 
and started waiting to sell the weapons or the items once I've combined them, that's when my cash just like got out of hand and I had more than I knew what to do with. Um, so you don't have to. They did balance the game. So if you just sell the stuff as you get it, you're going to be fine. Um, but if you want to have like extra mines and pipe bombs and things like that going into boss fights and have enough money to kind of play around with in the game, then that's kind of um, how you should handle it. Uh, and then the final part of Duke is the hunting in the meat. And Matt, this drove me crazy. So they let you hunt and kill animals before they tell you how it works, before they give you the ability to cook recipes. So I killed a bunch of fish. I killed the first batch of chickens that I came across, and I got to Duke, and I sold them. And then, like, 35 or 40 minutes later in the game, the whole cooking thing opens up. And <laughs> the animals in the game are finite. They don't respawn. Mm. There are only so many. And you'll need, like, for some recipes, you'll need, like, four meats, three poultry, two fish. I never saw fish again, Matt. So I, <laughs> I never completed a single recipe in the game. Not one. Mm. So that's something to keep in mind. Do not sell the meat, poultry, or fish that you collect throughout the game. Just keep it. Um, and then eventually, the whole recipe thing will open up in Duke's menu, and you can start making dishes. And they're important because those dishes will do things like increase your movement speed, increase your maximum health. It's like permanent buffs that you can get in the game. So I finished the game with Vanilla Ethan. Like, uh, none of his stats were boosted <laughs> oh, at all. Oh, Ethan's always a little vanilla, I think. <laughs> well, I think he seems vanilla, but again, as in the later parts of the game, you start to realize that he is, in fact, not vanilla. Yeah, well, I mean, you see that at the beginning where early on I was just like, why do they keep mangling this guy's hands and he's fine? Oh, mm -hmm. like he just pours alcohol on his hands and it's like, a, and then there's a point where something happens, okay, something's going on. Like, early on, I, th I just thought they were being, like, dumb video game thing. Uh, you know, where I, you know, oh, you took a shot to the face, but you're fine because you like ate a cookie kind of thing. Um, <laughs> uh, but eventually something happens and you're like, oh, OK, so you're doing you're doing something with this. OK, sure. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some there's some I'm, I'm not super impressed by the storytelling in this game. Um, it was uh, yeah, let's talk about the story. It was uh, I mean, like the, I mean, the premise is fine. Like, you know, it's a, it's a natural extension of seven. Um, it comes a little, there's a little like vignette at the beginning that, uh, you know, kind of recaps seven a little bit and reveals that you gave the vaccine to Mia. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, I don't know why, like there's a bunch of times where I'm, I just like somebody say a line or something will happen and, the, and then so I'm just like, that was awful. Like the, like the, I, I, I'm, the actors are doing their best, but the writing is bad in this thing, like moment to moment, line by line. And there's like little things that I just thought were weird or like. You're fighting a boss, and you like, you figure out how to kill them, and or like what their weakness is. And as you're hitting their weakness, they're like, "Why are you doing this?" And I'm just like, "Because I, you tried to eat me. Like, what <laughs> the fuck do you think I'm trying to do?" Like, it's, it's very. It, it, I mean, there, I, there I, are I, plot yeah. holes too. Like there are opportunities where all the henchmen can kill you, yeah. and instead of doing that, they like throw you down a set of stairs and walk away, or they just spare you for some unknown reason. Um, now, later on, I will say this, one of the henchmen, that stuff is revealed why he lets you live. And I just kind of spoiled something by saying he. But there is one of them where it's explained. The rest are not. Like, they all want to kill you, and they make no qualms about it. Mm -hmm. And they have plenty of chances to kill you. Like, Lady Demestric, whatever, she has, like, five chances to kill you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Never does. Like there's well, she had one... a lot more than that. I just ran past her a bunch of times. I'm like, you're a little faster, lady. Like you, <laughs> this could have been all over real fast. I, I I'll say this though. I also think that her section of the four henchmen is the best section of the game. So yeah, like they they definitely front loaded this with the best. Uh, what well, seems to be the best villain and the best like gameplay ideas in terms of how she interacts with you. Mm -hmm. um, after that section, like moving on to the new the uh, the the bloodborne guy. Um, like I, I lost a little motivation mm -hmm. and it just felt a little more, a little more generic than it had, which is funny. Cause all I was doing is running around a mansion, plugging stupid keys into things to open doors, which is very resident evil. Like, it's like, you know, you, you, it's, it's very, um, like it's, it's, you, you, it, you know, you're playing resident evil just in the way it's all laid out and how you're like making progress. Um, the, the influence of resident evil four is very, very obvious. Yeah, like, um, well, you can shoot, right, like them in the right down to the broken to economy, really. 
Like I really um, like the combat. I think it gives you a lot of options. Like you can. Like, I, I still think it's a little clunkier than it needs to be. Um, and my main thing is like I don't like the first person. Okay. I, I don't. I don't think first person does it any favors. And like they try to do like environmental stuff. Like there's there's points where like you're you know there's, there's like you know, the the you know her daughters like turn into flies and like swarm you as you're trying to get away from them. And I, you know I'm running around the room trying to do the thing I need I know I need to do to make them vulnerable to 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 hit them. But like Ethan's got his hands up in front of the camera, like waving bugs away. I'm just like, move, dude! Like I, need, I have to see what I need to hit the fucking button to do. Like it's it's it gets in your way all the time. And like I also feel like I would have more of a connection to Ethan if I could see him. Um, but like it's. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I would say I disagree with that. I like playing it in first person. I don't like first person stuff really anymore. Yeah. And uh, I I think I'd rather have had it be more like Resident Evil Four. Okay. Um, like the over the shoulder view, you mean? Yeah, like or, you know, the, like a lot of the first person stuff is, is uh, effective in the cutscenes, but in terms of playing the game, I just continually get annoyed with the with the first person stuff. And yeah, the like fact being able that, to like, move I, freely while I shoot. And uh, I mean, you could do that in third person too. Like that's yeah, but it's always like they always slow you down. Like I like being able to run, sprint, like shoot, pop, run. Um, I like being able to shoot enemies in like the kneecap and have them maimed so you can get past them. Um, I don't feel I mean, like I, do I had that, that freedom four. in the third-person Resident Evil games. I do all that in four. Like you, 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 you could. You, I mean, you don't have to make them move as slow as they did in four and five when they're when they're aiming. Um, it just, you know, that's a. I mean, you know, uh, Nathan Drake doesn't. Like you can, you can do that. They can just make it more like Uncharted or something. Um, it, I just don't. I think the it, running it, is really sluggish. I still suspect that might be on purpose. I think it's on purpose, and um, the other thing that bugs me is like I think he should slide around obstacles easier. When you're usually when I'm backing up, trying to like you know give me give me, get some distance, like he gets caught on like little background things or like yeah. little like floor stuff. And I was like, what is this? 2008? Like I've this talked is, about this that is before how, on Game Face about how yeah, this is not just, how things they work just be anymore. Like the objects are in, yeah, like aren't there even though you can see them. Yeah, but you want to make me slow down a little bit to like kind of like edge around them because I, so I lose a little you know ver, you know little. Uh, you know, direct distance between them. So I have to spend, spend some time with the characters and kind of sliding around it. Sure. But he gets stopped too much. Like, I'm just like, okay, where and I, and I'm, I'm like, Oh, I'm getting hit by the thing. What's going on. I turn around and like, you know, I'm like right on the corner of a wine barrel or something. And I'm just like, well, you can't just let me go around that. Like it's clear what yeah. I want to do. Um, so I, I find, I find it more frustrating than anything, anything like, um, I get through it and like, it's, you know, it feels good when you kill something, but um, I guess it's half and half. Like I'll, you know, I'll be honest. I, I don't love this game. I like it. I don't love it. I, I think it's it, like I would kind of be okay just walking away from it right now. Huh? I really like, enjoyed I it. I literally plowed through it. I was hopelessly. It is the it. most enjoyable Resident Evil since four. Like without question. I like and I like a lot of what they're they're doing. But I am hitting the point where I would rather just watch someone play it. Yeah, huh, interesting. I, I really do not like. I do not really like playing. I liked it in the demo. I was like, "Oh, this is all right. Like, this feels better than seven. It does feel better than seven. Like, I it controls better than seven. I played a little bit of seven early in the week to sort of like prepare, mm -hmm. um, and like because I hadn't played it before, so I want to you know know what I was. So I played a couple hours. Uh, I stopped uh, the second time I fell asleep playing it. Um, I I did not find that game engaging in any way, shape, or form. Um, this one's much better. I think I think I like this one a lot more. Um, I'm, it's just also just cause it's weirder, like, and not in like a sort of like, oh, it's weird and gross. And like, what's going on? I don't understand what's going on in seven. And this one, it's just like, there's the Duke and like all these weird monster people and all the, you know, the, the, the four Lords are fucking bizarre. Like, yeah, like that not is like the a resident... rip off of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like yeah. The, the, this is the resident evil weird that I like. Yeah. Um, it's like, why is there a 10 foot tall vampire woman? Who, wh why are you asking questions? There is one. <laughs> like, go for it. Yeah. It's like, you know, like, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, that's kind of like, we're not going to explain why. And even like little things were like, you know, you saw in the trailers as well, like she can extend like claws out of her, out of her fingernails, which reminds me of Tyrant. I'm just like, so there's like a, there's like a visual language of Resident Evil is being perpetuated, even if, even though it feels, they've gone really far afield here. Yeah. Like it's still there. Like it's, you know, you, you, it doesn't feel like you're in another game series. So, so I think that's a very admirable thing that they managed to change things up aesthetically and, and sort of setting wise so much and still make you remember that you're playing resident evil. Yeah. Um, like they, they did a lot of good things in this. It's just, I don't know. Like, I, I think I just don't have my, any patience for horror anymore. Could be. 
Um, I was hopelessly addicted to it. I literally basically played it the whole thing, like not in one sitting because eventually I had to go to bed, but I got up the next day and finished it. So basically two sittings I played this game. I was hooked. I really liked it. Um, the So we talked earlier about how the difficulty is kind of like a sawtooth. I would argue the design is kind of like that too. The early parts of the game, the stuff that Matt has played so far, really combat heavy, um, really confrontation heavy. The further you get into the game, there's less gunfights and there's more exploration. There's more puzzles to solve. Um, I did feel kind of like the whole middle part of the game was lacking in action a little bit. I mean, it does mm-hmm. give you an opportunity to kind of just collect a bunch of money and kind of upgrade your arsenal and kind of, you know, collect some ammo and stuff like that. But it does kind of go through these periods, like the beginning of the game, combat heavy, not as many puzzles, middle chunk of the game, really puzzle heavy. And then the end of the game, the combat kind of ramps up again. Um, But it wasn't kind of an even mix. What did you think about the puzzles in the game, Matt? Have you got to too many of them? Probably not. I mean, you're still in the combat. I mean, they they seem pretty normal. Like, you know, there's the open, you know, so far it's just like, you know, here's a thing, look at the thing. Yeah, you can pull the thing out of the thing and not tell you what you use. You're like, you got to figure out, okay, you need a key for this. You got to figure out how to get into here. And then, like, where's the key? Yeah. But it's like things like, you know, it's, it feels a little railroady still. Like there's a, you know, there's 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 two main keys you need in the in the castle, and like one of them one of them is an obvious like objective, and the other is like you end up in a room that they literally won't let you leave until you find the key. Yeah. And the only way to find the key is to look at everything until the white prompt pops up. You know, it's not like I figured I saw the key and was like, oh, right. that's where it is. It was like yeah. it's like I went near something and the A button prompt came up and I hit that and I got it. Like it was like. There's nothing particularly satisfying about that. And then the, uh, I'm trying to think of other puzzles like, um, like the labyrinths I like a lot. Um, Those are even the though rolling I, metal ball puzzles. Yeah. yeah. Even though again, um, you you could just let me look at it. Like you like, like the first one you do like there's a section where you have to like roll it in the middle of the thing past like some bottomless pits. That's the hardest and, one. And, and the and first one is the hardest one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't, see, and it's not hard because it's hard. It's hard because you can't see the middle of the model. Like it's like well, what like, I eventually like, figured out the is they want off, you to dude. tilt it so you can see it. You can, but once the ball gets there, the angle of the tilt changes, so you you're stuck partly behind the yeah. the, the rampart. Yeah, and like there's nothing. nothing it's it's it, I, and it's like that's a really cool idea. And that execution, that first one, like really soured it's me the hardest a little one. bit. The first one and is the, by far the hardest yeah. of all of them. It's really and the, weird. the second one was like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. Okay, that's fine. Um, so I like that, um, but it's like, um, I, a couple of them had this stupid uh, thing with the the braziers that you had to like light on fire by knocking them into things, yeah. and like one of them, the second one I think, where you have to like knock it through a wall and then you have to knock it back to hit the other uh, second one and then open the thing. I could not get it to hit the second oh, one. Oh, really? To save my life. <laughs> well, the like, funny part shot. is the B-roll is showing one of those those puzzles right now. I right shot in it. Time I with pushed you. it. I pushed the <laughs> other thing. I put it, and I, I I wasted like ten bullets on it. I'm like, that's the thing that's bugging me. It's like, okay, you clearly want me to shoot this thing because you're giving me ammo in the room. But I'm like, why are you making me waste bullets on this in, imprecise physics bullshit? Have you got and to the one yet where they you have to set the zombie on fire? Yeah, like yeah. it's. That's pretty clever. I, I mean, that's cool. It's cool. It's it's inventive, but like I, I don't know if I'd call it fun. Like it, it's it's so imprecise at times uh, that it annoys me. Um, I don't know. Like it's it's uh, there's a bunch of moments that I just felt don't match the production value. Yeah. Uh, in terms of mechanics. I mean, I'll say this about the story. We kind of just jumped out of the story without kind of coming to any conclusion about it. A lot of the things that when I was at your point of the game. And I was like, oh, none of this is making sense. I don't get this. A lot of that stuff does make sense at the end. And I'm not going to say what things mm-hmm. that you mentioned because I don't want to ruin it for anyone. Uh, but I felt like you when I was at your point. I'm like, this stuff, like, th- there's plot holes. This stuff doesn't make sense. Like, why is this happening? Like, is he, like, is Ethan a god? Why is he missing part of his hand? And it's just like a, a mere flesh wound. A lot of that stuff does get explained. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it does. Like, I've just... Um... I guess for you, it seems like that, like, you know, you kept playing because you liked the gameplay and maybe you were in, in, interested to find out what the answers to these things were. For me, I am just so worn down by the stupidity of Resident Evil as a franchise in yeah. terms of narrative <laughs> that I was like, none of these answers are going to be good. Yeah. Like, I, I don't care what your stupid answer to, like, all these dumb ideas. You know, like, you're not intriguing me. You're just irritating me at this point. You know, just tell me, a, just just get me through it. 
Um, so yeah, like I, I, I don't know, like I'm torn on this one. Like I like it, but I don't like it as much as I want to like it. And like, like you said, you took like two sittings to get through it. it. Took me like four sittings to get through the castle. Wow. Like I just kept, I kept getting like one mask and going back and saving and being like, eh, I think I'm done for now. Like I would, I would play in like 40 to 40 minute spurts. Like I just, it just, it just hasn't grabbed. And it's weird. Cause like the demo, I was like, I played for like, you know, you know, I didn't, I played like 20 minutes. I didn't realize it was as short as it was. Like I didn't get to the end, but I did get to the end. Cause I got to the part where you open that gate with the two discs. Yep. And I like, do like, oh, I'll open the, I'll save it. And then I go come back as it's late. I'll do it the next day. And then the, and then the demo was gone. Um, but then I found out that like you, once you open the gate, the demo was over. Um, but like I, at that point I was like, oh, I want, I really want to play more of that. I wanted to, to do more of that. And like on this, I'm just like, mm, I'm good. I'm, I don't know. Like, I might not be in the right frame of mind for it somehow. Like I, it's just, I don't, I really don't like the first person. I really hate the perspective. Hmm. I really don't think that works for Resident Evil. I don't like it at all, especially if there's no VR, like the VR kind of could excuse it in seven. This is not excusable to me. Like they should have gone back to third person. Hmm. Like I, I, the more I think about it, the more it really, really doesn't work for me. Yeah. I, re I really like it. I think it just, as far as the combat is concerned, it makes it way better. And it, I don't know. It's just a difference of opinion. Um, mm. Yeah, and like I really, all I want all I want is the option. Like I don't even say take away first person. Just give me a, you know give me give me an option to jump out to third person. Like that should be possible. They're not yeah, going to do I would it. I agree with that. Why not give people the option to do it? I I mean, it's probably like you you put that many you put all those polygons for Ethan on the screen. You're probably going to have to have a visual downgrade of the environment. So that's probably why they wouldn't do it. But yeah. Um, I, and another part, I think feeding into the combat, I like how the enemies are way smarter than they were in something like Resident Evil 4. Way more elusive, way quicker, way faster. Um, I, I felt like I was eh, I was on I, the I, edge of my seat pretty much the whole time I played this game. There was that middle I just, part I'm, I'm just talking annoyed. about where it kind of settles into a groove where, you know, it wasn't quite as intense. But the beginning, the first act and the final act, I thought, were really intense. Yeah, I I don't I disagree. I I found it irritating. I like because like exactly what you described. Like I understand what you mean when when the things you like about that. But like to me, having to memorize an animation pattern to hit someone with a limited ammo situation is just annoying to me because that's not how it works in real. Like 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 it's like oh this werewolf's gonna do the same thing as the other five werewolves when he leans up to the list. It's like I I, I find I, that's just pattern memorization and it doesn't interest me. Um, which maybe is weird for someone who plays Dark Souls to say, but like, um, I don't know, like, like Dark Souls doesn't, Dark Souls has more variety in how they come at you, even though they are pretty dumb much of the time. Um, I don't know. Like it's, it's like, I find myself uh, irritated and pleased in this game, but it I was, never I thought find it was too easy to get irritated at it. Like I never felt like yeah. I never I mean, got I never I have not died or anything, but and, and I don't understand the health system because it seems like you can't like it, it feels really generous on when you run out of life. It's really like, hard to die. Yeah, really like, hard. You have to get overwhelmed by like five lichen before you're gonna Yeah. Die. And they've really like um you know, Resident Evil used to be very much about health management. Like, it was yeah. like okay, this, ma this many green herbs gives me this much health back yeah. and this much plus a red herb gives me that much. And so I, have, I need to wait until the, the meter is down to this color before I use this, but I can wait till it's yellow to use one green herb. And the, But do I want to use one? You know, th that was part of the game was sort of the management of that. And this, they've just sort of like, the one bottle heals you completely. Like, you're good. Don't worry about it. And it's just like, there's a point at which you're like, what? maybe it should just be regenerative at this point. Yeah, well, like, it is like, kind of because, and I haven't figured this out exactly, but there were times where I was on the fringe of death, never used health, and eventually it went up to a place where I wasn't seeing like the red on the screen anymore. So yeah, yeah, that's happened. There is like, some kind of regenerative stuff. In I it. assume that's different, probably in the harder difficulties. I'm playing a normal. Oh. Um, so, oh, dude, there's a hard. Di so when you finish the game, a couple things unlock mercenaries which i'll talk about in a second right but there's also which the game tells you about before you like in some of the load screens it says like oh do this for mercenaries and get it i was like okay i guess mercenaries are, i mean we knew that but yeah it's weird to me that the, some one of the load screens like revealed one of the unlocks uh <laughs> even though we already knew about it from like the announcements and stuff if you don't if you aren't plugged into game news like you're like oh i guess there's a thing okay i thought that was weird yeah but, and so it unlocks that, and then you get all this these credits that you can use to unlock all kinds of stuff, like mm -hmm. like 
concept art and things like that. Um, and then there's also a harder difficulty setting that un- unlocks called like Shadow of something or other. I played yeah, sh- that Shadow of the Village or Village yeah. of Shadow or something like that. Matt, yeah, I played that. I'm not exaggerating. It. I think it took 40 bullets to kill one like it. <laughs> not. I'm not exaggerating. I think it took 40 bullets to kill one like it. I don't know. The only way I think you could get through it is if you had like unlimited ammo. And even then, I don't think you could. Like it is the hardest hard mode I have ever experienced in my life. I played it for like 20 minutes and I was like, nope, <laughs> I'm good. Um, Maybe it's like, I mean, I know a lot of the uh, the the hard line, like, you know, speed runs and stuff like that for Resident Evil tend to just be like run around everything. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's some of that. Like, it could maybe be. They're expecting maybe they're that. just asking you to just run from everything. But you don't run very fast, and the enemies are just as fast as you. It's hard to run away from enemies in this game. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing I liked about the plot in this is it wasn't – like, you you meet normal people in this. It's not just they're all, like, a demigod or some crazy super cop or whatever. You just meet, meet normal people just – trying to live their lives in the middle of this crazy, like, werewolf mm-hmm. apocalypse. And to me, it kind of grounds the story a little bit. It makes it seem a little more relatable. Um, and I will say this, like, after the first half of the game, that stuff does kind of go away. You don't run into just kind of citizens anymore. But it does kind of set the tone for the game at the beginning, and I like that about it. Um, I One big complaint I do have about the combat is I feel like the blocking is too slow and sluggish. Like, I just missed blocks all the time, like, where I was just too late to respond to it, or he just took too long to get his arms up to block. And blocking is a really important element of this game um, because mm-hmm. you get trapped inside with, like, four or five lichen. You have to block, or they're going to kill you. Um, and so it's a much bigger deal. And then you also have kind of your... Um, I, had, I had trouble with that because I forgot you could do that. Oh. Like, after after the... Because ca- you don't really use it in the castle much. Yeah, you don't have to. Um, so it's, it's a little weird that they introduced it because you do have to use it to survive a lot of the village stuff yep. at the beginning. Yep. And then they, they go through this whole long section where, like, you don't need it. And, that, I mean, it's certainly not going to help you against, you know, the swords and the and the claws. Uh, and, like, then you get to back to the lichens. And there's a point which I'm like, what the... How can I... Oh, right, I can block. I, you know, it was just one of those things I forgot about. Well, a lot of the gameplay um, in this is about distance, as you mentioned earlier, getting your mm-hmm. distance away. And after you block, you can tap the L1 button, and you can perform like a combo, like a punch and then a kick that will put that'll throw them away. Or if you don't time it exactly right, you can at least just push them away, which will give you enough time to at least reload a couple shells into your gun or pop off a couple shots before they get back to you. Um, so distance is like a big part of the combat in this game as well. Um, and I feel like that's another area where the first-person perspective helps as far as judging distances and stuff like that. I just, I really enjoyed this game. I, I like it a lot. I would honestly say it's probably my second favorite Resident Evil behind Resident Evil 4. I don't think it's mm-hmm. as good as Resident Evil 4. A big part of that is it's nowhere near as big as Resident Evil 4. I also didn't resonate with the characters in the game as much as I did with the characters in Resident Evil 4. Like, I'm not going to remember anyone in this, like some of the characters that I did from RE4. No, I mean, I'm going to remember uh, Lady Nemetresque. Yep. And, um, I mean, Mother Miranda is a cool design. And the weird ventriloquist dummy is, is at least, like, mildly creepy. Yeah. Um, or at least the performance is. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know who. I don't know who the the actress is for that, but she's really throwing herself into it. Yeah, so I appreciate sure. that. Um, the one of my big issues in terms of like you know kind of the the presentational narrative structure is I think because uh, you know Demetrescu is is obviously the first major villain you fight, but Heisenberg, the Bloodborne werewolf, is sort of like kind of the leader of the four like he's sort of the he's the dominant one in yeah. the four. he's the one you see the most at first and he's sort of the one you you run into first and that and he is just he just kills the game dead when he's on screen he's so boring he's like he's just a big top, hairy man. dude yeah. like like i am not impressed by you sir like i i, I am not I, I i the other three are way more interesting in terms of like antagonists and the fact that it tries to build him up into something is is silly to me, because um, there's like points where you're reading like 
you know, letters from Lady Demetrescu in, her, in the castle or like the cutscenes where she's like, where she like hates that guy. And she's, she, you know, she's, she's like, oh, how dare she treat him the way she treats me? I'm like, yeah, I agree. Like, we, <laughs> I know you're trying to kill me, but like, I would, I, you know, we can definitely have that conversation if you want to. Like, I'm, I'm right there with you. Like, you know, I will say this um, of all the characters in the game, he is the one whose motivations are most clearly spelled out by the end of the game. And I think, a lot of the stuff that you're like talking about right now, it you you understand it by the end of the game, mm-hmm. and I don't want to ruin anything. But he ends up being like one of the focal figures in the plot by the end of it all. Yeah, that's one of the things why. I was worried about. Yeah, if you don't um, like the character, he doesn't really. That doesn't change much throughout the game. Like his writing doesn't get better. The voice mm-hmm. actor's delivery doesn't really get any it's better. It's weird. Like I don't like I don't know like. I can't quite put my finger on why I don't like the the writing in this in the way because like it's not like Resident Evil Four is high drama or anything, but Resident Evil Four, I don't know. Resident Evil Four seems a little more self aware in yeah. terms of what it is, and this it feels like I they're think trying RE4 to. Four is intentionally campy, and this yeah, game I mean, is they, unintentionally they, campy. I think there might be some <laughs> of that in play, like or like no one told anyone. Like yeah. you, you even kind of see it in like the. Um, and like they put up some videos of like motion capture for the for the various scenes, and like you can kind of like I, I mentioned the the woman who plays the the ventriloquist dummy, um, the doll. Yeah. Um, she gets it. Yeah. Like you can see in those videos, like she knows what she's in. Like she's she's going for for broke on that shit. And like the the Heisenberg guy seems like he's more like trying to give a performance. Yeah. And like I'm not sure that was really where you needed to be. Like there's just lines that no one no human can say in this game, but they really try. Well, they're and not the humans. Trying Matt. is probably the problem. <laughs> but most of the characters aren't human. Well, the actors are human, yeah. and there's no way to deliver it. Um, some of it look it's up and down, like some other parts of the game. Like some I, like for instance, like. The ladies' daughters. Some of the stuff that they say, I think, is great. Yeah, um, they're really good. Um, uh, and like the, yeah, Lady, but again, Demetresk is great, I think. But again, like Demetresk and her daughters lean into the camp. Yeah, like yeah. they're they know what they're doing, and like there's moments where you know Heisenberg feels like he doesn't know what he what game he's in. Yeah, it's like do you <laughs> do you think you're an Uncharted villain, sir? Because that <laughs> actually is not that's what we're a pretty doing good here. comparison. He does kind of come off that way for sure. Yeah. Um, but look, I really enjoyed it. I do wish it was longer. Um, spending... It does feel like I just, I mean, I know I'm, I'm not apparently even halfway through, but like it felt like it was rushing along by the point I'm at. Because yeah. um, like you said, like I, I'm pretty sure I'm right at the second boss and it did not take me as long as it took to get to the lead. I mean, I think the second boss in particular, I think it, the whole thing took me like an hour. Yeah. Like, whereas just, Lady Demetresk took me almost three to get through her yeah. castle. And, and I mean, to be fair, Lady Demetresk is very much a, you know, it's a Resident Evil building. You know, yeah. you got to you gotta find the keys and open the doors and find the mask, put the mask on the thing and go over, get, get this mask. Come back. Yeah. Like, there's more, um, it's more involved and you're, they're forcing you to go all over the maze, basically. Yeah. Um, whereas this just felt a little more. And I'm like, oh, look, do I, I, I guess I kind of prefer that they got to, got straight to it with the second section because, like, I'm, I guess some people, and maybe that's me. I don't know. It depends if they've done it differently. Maybe some people like, come out of that castle and be like, oh, my God, I can't do that three more times. Yeah, <laughs> like, thinking like, that you'd have to do yeah. it three more. Yeah, I could see that totally. And it's not that way at all. Mm-hmm. There's no other castle in the game like that at all. And some people no, may I mean, not like smart that. To, <laughs> they're smart to front load it with that, though, I think, because it, it gets you the shot of Resident Evil. Yeah. You it's, need to sort of feel It's the part of the game home. that's most like traditional Resident Evil games, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, um, it's, it's, I think it's, yeah, as much as it's not really grabbing me, like, I think it's extremely well designed. Um, although you're right that the economy breaks if you gather everything, like, like you're, you're kind of stuck there. Cause like, if you, if you, if you make it so you have to collect everything or almost everything to be, have a, have functional purchasing power, you're kind of screwing the more casual players. Right. Yeah. But you know, the end result is that like people like us who are inclined to collect everything are going to break the economy and buy every, buy them out every time. Yep. Uh, and look, I don't mind that. Like I, you know, Resident Evil 4 did that a little bit too, or yeah. there's a point where you could just buy whatever the hell you wanted. Um, and you know, I, I don't know why the, 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 the merchants in strange European countries are the most appealing characters in Resident Evil, but like they've done it again, pretty <laughs> yeah. much. The Duke, the Duke is great. Yeah, he is um, great. He even references the merchant. Yeah, he does. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> so, um, which is funny because like he's I remember not for as a while, good as the merchant, though. No, he's not as good as the merchant. But I remember for a while, I was like, "Is that is that the Resident Evil Four merchant? Like, what happened to it?" <laughs> yeah, did he just like get lazy and <laughs> really good? Evil 4 sit around and play video the, games since yeah, he the made last all game? Money from Leon, and he just let himself go. <laughs> like that was the end of it. Um, he is a great character, no, though. And no, like I said, they character. do develop him a little bit more later on too, which is awesome. Yeah, um, and he's also good in the sense that like like he feels he feels like he fits in the world, but there's still something a little off. Yep. Um, they do a good job. Like that's a, that's what's frustrating to me is like, um, the the Resident Evil camp is still there, but there's moments where they get real close to like a Silent Hill style like yeah. unease and kind of terror element. Yep. And like they just don't go for it, at least not so far. And like that's that's disappointing. And I know that's not what Resident Evil is about. Resident Evil is more about you know gross out gore monsters and like you know like getting hit in the face with things. Mm -hmm. But like. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Resident Evil. Resident Evil doesn't do a lot of like you know Silent Hill style like terror. You know, it, it's it, Resident Evil is not as cerebral as some of the other uh, horror games around there. But like, they get close to something a couple times in this so far, and I just sort of felt felt like oh, and then it turned out to just be like a a shootout, and I hit the thing, and it, that, then now I get to shoot him with a shotgun, and now you're done. Like yeah. it's like. And then Ethan doesn't react to it at all. Like, just like, <laughs> like you, you beat like this, you beat like a, a horrifying vampire fly monster girl, and he's just like, he's like, yeah, stupid witch. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. Like, like okay, dude. Like that's I mean, your he's been through it though already. He had to. I mean, he's seen the... some shit, but like, I mean, there's a point at which you're like, I, mean, I don't think anything in Resident Evil Seven would prepare you for what you see in this. Right. Like, this is a whole new level of shit. Like you're, it's like, wait a minute, like creatures from <laughs> folklore. Are you what? Like, yeah. It's uh, I don't know. Like it's 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 frustrating to me because I really want to like it more than I do, but I right now I'm just sort of like, oh, it feels like it feels weirdly disjointed. But then like five minutes later, I'm like, oh, this is great. And this is yeah. you know, it, it just like you said, it's like a sawtooth. Not not just in difficulty, but in terms of just everything. It's just up and down and up and down and up and down. Yep. At least for me. What do you like, think I about see, the visuals? I think they're really good. I like them a lot. I'm disappointed um, in them, honestly, a little bit. Uh, th th there's like some, you know, up close stuff can be a little muddy in places, but in general, like I, I think it looks great. It's not a bad looking game by any stretch. I just, I don't think it's a next gen game. I guess is what I'm getting at. Like, no, I, I mean, we're not, we're not going to have next gen games. Uh, this thing didn't install on my internal drive on the Xbox, so it is definitely a last gen game being. You know, slightly enhanced by running on harder, better, harder hardware. What was the <laughs> better hardware. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm I, I'm not I'm not expecting anything to be next gen unless it has the XS on it or it has you know or it's, or it's Ratchet and Clank. Um, so uh, I'm fine with that. But I think it looks really good. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you're, yeah. I mean, I it looks like one of the best looking last yeah. gen games. Basically. Neither ray tracing turned on. It looks really nice. Like you know, I I have no complaints about the visuals. Really, it's uh, it's, it's yeah. I thought the character models, little eh, the hair stuff like in that. places. I mean, I don't like the the bloodborne style werewolf hair. Yeah. Um, I just think that looks messy. Uh, that might be intentional, but it doesn't look like hair. It doesn't look like fur to me. You no, know what I mean? It, like, it, it just yeah. it just looks like some kind of special effect, and it doesn't really work for me. Yeah, don't get me um, wrong. I'm not saying it's a bad looking game. And I'm there's just... like thing, you know, like it's like weird, like Lady Demetrescu will like clip through the furniture when she tries to walk around it to get to you. Yeah. It's, like, it, it's not perfect. There's no, um, you know, there's 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 moments where it really feels like a video game, yeah, uh, which is frustrating because there's moments where it doesn't look like you know walking into that castle the first time you're like damn like this is you know this all the detail and all the the ray tracing bouncing off all the reflective surfaces and all the gold trim on all the wall i mean it looks impressive like it looks you know i've been in places like that in europe you know for like museums and places and the castles and stuff and like it's like they did some research on this thing it feels like walking through one of those places and you're sort of like how would anybody live here it's like yeah, yeah. what if you spilled something um <laughs> I think my patience is running out for cross-gen releases at this point. It's like I spent, you know, 550 bucks on a new console, and I am at the point now where I'm starting to expect to see games that look like it's running on a brand new $550 game. Yeah, well, I'm not going to expect that from a game that started development three years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, you get I'm just saying generally my patience is starting to run out for that stuff. I don't really have, I mean, we've been over that before. Like you have a very different expectation of what next gen hardware means. Like to me, buying these systems was more like I'm getting a video card upgrade. Yeah. And uh, eventually we will see some stuff that can't be done on the, you know, we're going to have anything. Ratchet and Clank is going to be one of our first tastes of that. 
Um, sounds like Gears of War five, or Gears of War six, whatever the new Gears of War is, is going to be that maybe. Um, but right now we, we're still in a transitional period, and uh, you know, in a in a normal transitional generation situation, uh, I would still be periodically going back to the previous system to play these games. Um, yeah. You know, I just you know, this would be a PS4 game, and I'd go back and play that instead because they don't you know support different generations. Uh, I kind of appreciate that I can just play everything on the on the two next gen boxes and not swap back and forth. Oh, I like that part. Um, don't get me wrong. Um, I'm just kind of tired of these games that are straddling the fence instead of just going all in on next gen. Um, I mean, that's just how it works, though. Like, there's always, you know, early new gen stuff always is kind of like that. You know, the Madden syndrome. It's like, oh, we pared a bunch of stuff down and it doesn't, it's not as great. But next year, next year will be amazing. I mean, this is really um, the first time we've ever done this, though, where there's been yeah. true dual gens going at both times. Like, and yeah, it's been an like, adjustment I mean, period. I'm just being honest. It's an adjustment period for me, and I don't know that I like it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, you, you know, it's I'm ready to turn it. the page. I realize a lot of people still don't have like. Well, that's the, here's the consoles. here's what I'm here's what I'm trying to say. There is no page. Yeah. There's no page to turn. It's a transition. It's a it's a it's a fade out. It's a fade in. Yeah. It's, it's no, there's no hard line between these things. You're eventually you're just going to be you're you're a frog in a next gen pot. And one day you're going to be boiled in ray tracing and you're never going to realize it happened. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on to talk about the bonus content, uh, Mercenaries. It is unlocked, and we didn't know until I actually played it. I think the last time we talked about the game, we were kind of like, I wonder if you get it when it's first when you first start the game. Yeah, no. I don't know. Well, it, it also, uh, when I bought the game, it auto-installed uh, Reverse. Or right, whatever, and I yeah. uninstalled that because it's like, oh, this won't be live for another couple of months. I'm like, well, why are you taking up seven gigs of my hard drive, dude? <laughs> I'm not probably gonna not want to play it in seven months either. To be perfectly no, honest I, with you, yeah, I, I was like, Mm-mm. Yep. yeah, you can get, you can get, you can get out of my house, sir. Yeah, so so mercenaries unlocks when you finish the game. Um, it is a timed gauntlet of enemies that, and it's not timed as in time goes up. It's time ticks down. You have X amount of time to complete the objectives before you essentially fail. Um, and so with, with each round, you have X number of enemies that you need to kill before the timer ticks down. Um, you start out by purchasing equipment or weapons that you need from the Duke. Um, then you go out into the field and you just try to defeat as many as enemies as you can before the time runs out. A big part of being good at the game is, or at Mercenaries, is memorizing enemy placement, where they're going to spawn from, being able to, okay, I cleaned up this corner of enemies. Now I need to sprint over to this other area where I know the enemies are spawning. It almost becomes like a, a memorization thing that you have to go through an exercise. Um, once you've defeated a set number of enemies, a goal appears. You touch the goal to finish, and then you go back to Duke again, and you can use the lay that you've collected through the prior round to upgrade your weapons or buy new weapons. <laughs> Um, right next to Duke, there is some free ammo sitting kind of on a shelf that you can pick up between each round, which helps a little bit. Um, inside the matches, there are these orbs that you pick up. There's like these blue ones that you grab that can give you special abilities. Um, and the abilities are kind of cool. One of them made like zombies explode. So you take your first shot on a zombie, or not a zombie or whatever they are, lichens or whatever. You take your first shot on one that's kind of embedded in a group, and then it explodes, and it'll actually take out, like, the whole group of enemies. There was some fun stuff like that in there. Um, and you, and all that stuff carries over between areas. So if you finish the area, the next time you go, you'll still have all that stuff. So they kind of stack as long as you don't fail. Um, you can also – you can actually technically stack those abilities. So if you get the same ability twice, it just improves the functionality of those abilities. So you always want to, if you ever see an orb, grab it immediately. Um, and then any money that you have when you finish, that's counted towards your goal. You can, as I said, you can go back in and you can buy stuff. Um, but it ultimately is really kind of more like the uh, raid mode from Resident Evil Rev Revelations than the mercenaries mode from like RE4. Um, I did do not feel like it has a lot of staying power. I have not been able to find like online leaderboards like, it's, they're not in the game, and I went, like, just to, like, residentevil.com to try to find them. And the only thing that they really have there right now is your completion time based upon what difficulty setting you played on. So there's not a lot of motivation to get better at it because you don't see how everyone else is doing at it. And maybe that's coming later. I could not find it. Um, and maybe it's there now, and it's just hidden somewhere. I was not able to find it anywhere. 
So my motivation to keep playing it was not great, to be perfectly honest with you. And then the other thing, too, is that there are really only four areas in Mercenaries. There are two stages within each area, and the areas aren't the same. But, like, right now you're seeing, like, the village. Um, then after you complete this one, there's another stage that's also in the village, but it's in a different part of the village. But... They do do a pretty good job of kind of sprinkling in all the different enemy types from the game. They'll even throw in, like, mini-bosses here or there, like those big lichen we were talking about earlier, some of the armored guys, um, to kind of mix things up. But to me, the biggest, the biggest difficulty with completing these missions is just knowing where the enemies are spawning from. Once you kind of figure that out and you sprint over and you kind of memorize where all the enemy placement is, it becomes a lot easier to finish it. It's not so much skill to be perfectly honest with you, which is why I'm like, okay, since skill isn't a big reason why you finish this, then it should be there should be leaderboards because what's going to motivate you to do it? You're going to need leaderboards to see someone who's like really good at it and be like, hmm, how can I cut my time down to where that player's time is? So I would, I would not consider the mercenaries as like, if you're sitting on the fence on whether to buy it or not or if you wonder whether it's 60 bucks, oh, that's the other thing. I got the PS5 version for 60 bucks. So this is a next-gen mm-hmm. game quote, unquote, that is not priced at 70 bucks. So if you're trying to figure out if the $60 is worth it or not, I would not say, I'm on the fence, but there's Mercenaries, and so I'm going to buy it. Like, I would not weigh it that way. I played Mercenaries for a couple hours, and I was like, I get it. I'm good. Um, I did not have as much fun with it as I did in Resident Evil 4, for example. Um, But anyway... It was also newer in Resident Evil 4. Yeah, and now it's pretty much been in every one except for the last couple yeah and like look let's be honest other games have done that concept better yeah like it's not it's not like unique anymore that was that was the thing yeah this and isn't even like a like... horde mode either it's not like you have this objective of like defending this point or anything mm-hmm. it's literally just kill all the enemies you can see up at the up at the top left there on the screen it shows you how many enemies you've killed and how many you need to kill and that's your only objective it's just to make sure you've, in this case, you've killed all 23 enemies before the clock hits zero. So, And there are bonuses, like time bonuses and combos. So as you kill an enemy, time will get added onto your clock. But again, that just ties into even further what I was saying earlier about you need to memorize where the enemies are. Because if you're mm-hmm. not killing enemies, you're running out of time. So that's kind of the ebb and flow of the Mercenaries mode. I'm guessing they will... There will be DLC for this. Right now, like I said, there's four areas. There's tons of areas in the actual base game. I wouldn't be surprised by the time it's all said and done if there ends up being, you know, like 12 areas or something. But mm-hmm. Or like some classic Resident Evil areas or something. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's just going to depend on how much you like playing the core mode, which I haven't enjoyed yeah. all that much. So, I mean, it does unlock. I think it unlocks like a weapon or weapons or something for the campaign. But like... It's actually crazy. Like, like, like we said, it's not that hard anyway, so you probably don't need some kind of mercenary super weapon to, unless you just want another reason to play the game, I guess. Well, it's kind of crazy like how much stuff does unlock in this game when you finish it. So there's like this extra content tab inside the main menu, and you go there, and you have accumulated already a ton of credits from playing the campaign. So you don't even realize it, but as you're playing a campaign, you're accomplishing all these objectives. And when you finish the game, it shows you all the objectives that you've already accomplished. So you have this huge cache of credits that you can use to start unlocking stuff. And there is just, the list is gigantic. And a lot of it's just frivolous BS, like I said, concept art and stuff like that. Uh, But Mercenaries is one of them. And I think no matter what, you'll have enough money to unlock that. But um, that's pretty much how it works. Would I recommend replaying the campaign? I probably will replay this campaign um, on a higher difficulty setting. Um, not the one that unlocks when you finish the game. I'll never try that again. But I would also recommend like your first time like playing it the notch above normal because otherwise I just feel like it is too easy. I feel like I walked through the game. Um, and as you know, you know, the threat of death is what builds a lot of tension in all games, not just Resident Evil. So um, if you have not started playing it yet and you're thinking about getting it and you do get it, I would recommend playing it on the notch above the normal difficulty setting just as a pro tip. What about you, Matt? Were you happy with the difficulty setting as it is? Yeah. I don't know. Like, I don't find it very difficult, but I just find it annoying. So, like, I don't think I'd want to play it on a harder difficulty just because it would just take longer. It probably would be more annoying at that point, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's fine. Like, it, it's not, like, yeah, I, I, I can see why someone would say it was too easy. Yeah. I feel like it was. I, I, I did die a couple times. Like, I died in a boss fight. 
And then one time mm. I just got trapped in the corner of inside a building by literally like six lichen, and I just couldn't even get past them. I was just yeah. Like, I mean, it's just it's like the kind of the Resident Evil thing where it's like, you know, early on, uh, I'm like, oh my god, how do I deal with this thing? And then like once you kill a couple of them, you're like, oh, I get it. And then like by the you know by 20 minutes later, you're just running past them and don't even care. <laughs> it's like you know, yeah, it's uh, you know, it's just sort of a tradition at this point. I think yeah, I think that's a good way to describe it. I think if I were to play it again. I, I like I said I completed it the first time in a little under eleven hours. I feel like I could probably finish it in like five, honestly, because mm-hmm. you already know how to handle all the enemies. You know, already know all the puzzles. You already know where everything is located. I also would definitely one hundred percent it the next time. Um, I also would not waste the animals that I killed selling them to Duke <laughs> instead of using them in recipes. All those little things um, that you learn the first time through, you could apply the second time through, and I feel like I could cut a lot of time. I'll be interested to see what the speed run time is for this game. Uh, current speed runs seem to be hovering around uh, an hour and a half. Wow. That's a lot. Although, of uh, okay, the in- hour and a half one was, uh, was New Game Plus with the in- an infinite gun. Oh. Um, the uh, the two two hours, like there's a bunch of two hour uh, knife only, no healing speed runs. I could see that. Yeah. But anyway, I really enjoyed it. Matt's kind of lukewarm on it. Um You've I like it. it. I just I see why it got sevens and eights. Did it? There's a there's a yeah you know, like IGN gave it eight. A couple places gave I, it eight. I thought IGN gave it the lowest score of anyone. I don't know. I uh, I saw I read one review where they complained about the fact that like Lady Demetresque wasn't in the game enough, and it's like, bro, mm-hmm. you do realize like the game was made before she blew up, like. Who, I'm not mm-hmm. even going to call it who it was, but the person who wrote the review had basically allowed the fact that fans had latched onto her to affect how he evaluated the game. It's like, and also, it's like they're, I think they're showing. Doing, they showed her. Dude? I mean, obviously, she blew up, and so they focused on it. But also, like, they don't want to show the rest of the game. Yeah, like, like they only showed you like the begin, the early stuff, like as as the marketing campaign. So the rest of it would be a surprise. I was just like, who's and, your editor, man? Somebody should think, told you you're being crazy. <laughs> like I think that's that's uh, that's valid. Like you know, like we're only going to show you the very the first big enemy you fight. Yeah, uh, and that's that. Like the more How games you know do that, that more people are going to like fall in love with her, and she's being going to become this meme. Like there's no way to know that until it happens. No. Like it's absurd to hold Capcom's feet to the fire. Because fans loved her and she wasn't in the game enough. That's crazy. Like mm. whatever, it is what it is. Uh, so I highly recommend it. Matt, would you just would you recommend it to our Resident Evil fans? Yeah, I mean, especially if you like seven. I think this is an improvement in most respects. What about if you like um, four? Uh, it, it is absolutely the spiritual success, successor of four. Um, it is definitely the Resident Evil I have liked. I like the most after four. What about people um, who you, like the more traditional ones, who like love the RE2 remake or the RE3 remake? Uh, I mean, this is a very different beast mm-hmm. uh, than that. Um, yeah, you know, the first person perspective is annoying to me. Like, I, I, I just find myself constantly wishing I could see the back of Leon's head again. Um, like, it makes me want to replay four like more than anything else. I find like, that so I, strange. Like, you want something obstructing the screen. I don't get nothing, it. Yeah, yeah, all I you're doing is even... hiding enemies and stuff from your view. I have ne- never felt that way about a third-person view. But it I is. have felt that I mean, way his during this there, game. So he's going to cover up anything that's behind the head. Not if I'm lo- not if I'm aiming, because um, the camera pushes in. Uh, but his head also, is still I, there. I thought it's still there, but it's further down in the corner. Yeah. Like his head doesn't block anything. Like it's not, you know, neither does Nathan Drake's. Like I, I third, per- I'd rather be able to see my character and see what I'm running around. Um, and, in, and actually, uh, the most I have had my screen blocked by any game character is Ethan in this game when he puts his fucking hands up. Like I, I got, that I, li- often, I literally, it, it happened en- enough that I kept getting hit from it. Like in the boss fights, like I got furious at that. Like I was like, yeah. I think you need to play more of it, down. honestly. Um, I don't like, I, there's nothing in it that made me want to play more of it. I think a lot of regard. the things, but I'm just telling you as someone who's finished the game, a lot of the things that you're telling me that are annoying you aren't that big of a deal as you mm-hmm. play on through the game. Like they either disappear completely yeah, or they I mean, pop look, up like once or twice again. It's it's up against some some personal uh dislike walls of first person versus third person, yeah. of horror, I don't care about horror things, um, of you're getting in my way and trying to make it seem atmospheric, but you're mostly just annoying me because the 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 positioning of where you need to be to interact with things is so 
wonky that, and you get too oh, close. That, I'm surprised they didn't bring that up until now. Oh, I agree with that a thousand percent. Yeah, having you get to too like, close, the, just the, move that one pixel so that the icon yeah. will pop up so you can pick up something. Or and that's the problem because his yeah. hand covers the fucking prompt. Yeah, <laughs> like like I couldn't get it to pop up because I couldn't see or where I was. Enemies in relation are bearing to the down on you, and you're trying to get a key into a door, and the icon mm-hmm. won't pop up so you can put the key in the door. Because yeah. the icon goes away Annoying. if you get like too close to uh-huh. it. That's the thing that yep. makes me confuses the element. It's like okay, I'm too close to the yeah, ammo to right. pick it up. Is that what you're telling me? Okay, like sure. I definitely. And agree meanwhile, with that. if a, if an enemy drops an I- item, you can pick that shit up from like 20 feet away. <laughs> like it's so inconsistent. It's very weird. It, yeah, I agree with that. I'm surprised it took us so long to bring it up because it is definitely an issue, and it's, that is an issue that's there the whole time. It never yeah. goes away. Even Although if, again, yeah. like like you you know, I got used to it. Apparently, so did you. Like you just, you just address, just like okay, this is the way this game rolls, I guess. Yeah. Um, whereas the other stuff was more in my face about it, literally in the, in the case of his hands. But uh, no, yeah, it wasn't until like I, I, like, well, I was imagining, you know, going in my head, running through, running through the room, trying to find the shelf I needed to knock over, and I'm like, oh yeah, and I couldn't get it to work also because I got too close to the shelf and the prompt went away. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, when the I mean, pressure's like, on, I, it could be I'd really annoying. I'd love to annoying. knock this thing over, but I'm so close to it. Like, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not a thing and that happens. And the other thing, too, is that when that stuff's happening, you're not thinking to yourself, like, it's really hard to die in this game. Like, I, no, no matter what happens, like, I can't get over the mental wall of the enemies are right behind me. I need to get this damn key into the hole. Yeah, well, also because, like, you know, there's, there's, I mean, it's not as much as the old Resident Evil, but Resident, the old Resident, you know, those games have, the, have that element of, like, you know, there's a finite amount of resources and you have to manage them properly. That's not as, you know, because of the crafting, because of how plentiful you know, components are, that's not as prevalent in this game. It's, it's yeah. much more forgiving. Um, but there's an element of like you know, getting hit needlessly is a waste of resources. Yeah. And that's annoying. You know, it's like it's one of the reasons regenerative health bars became such a big thing was because you don't feel like that anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, that's much more appealing to the mainstream kind of you know, what would some people, some people call casual to me. It's just like, you're not wasting my fucking time. Yeah. Like, you know, cause there's a, you know, I remember at points where I'm like, okay, I'm just going to restart. Cause I waste, I wasted 13 bullets on this boss that it turns out I wasn't even supposed to fight and I'm not going to like <laughs> do that. I'm just going to go back and run through it this time, yeah. which like you want to talk about breaking my immersion. You know, why am I supposed to be afraid of anything? Yeah. If like that's what I can do if it doesn't work out right. Like, like, the other thing too is save points plentiful. There's typewriters everywhere. There yeah. are also oh, like checkpoints. Like, there's like checkpoints. Yeah, yeah like, and I couldn't quite figure out when it checkpointed, but sometimes it just would. And I was you know I was grateful that I didn't have to redo everything since the last typewriter. But like it seemed like semi random. That only happened to me once where I really got screwed and had to go back to a typewriter. There was only one, mm. literally one time in the whole game where I died and. I reappeared and I was like, "Fuck!" <laughs> the rest of the time, yeah, I didn't. I didn't feel easy. like there was. Even when I got irritated, I was like, "Okay, I waste all my balls." I'm gonna. Go. I didn't even go to the. I just hit restart in the menu, and it took me back to. Like, it didn't even take me back to my last typewriter. It was the beginning of the hallway I was in. Wow. It was like okay, I didn't. I that lost like two minutes. At that point. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, it's very generous in that regard. Um, I don't know if that changes on harder difficulties. If there's a mode where like it's you know typewriter only mode or something, the kind of thing, like that would probably add some challenge. Yeah. Um, but, but again, you can't control that. So it's not like you can like, like, it's not like you can force the game to, to only do I, as far as I know, I don't think there's a mode where you can just be, I'd be like, don't checkpoint me only let me save at typewriters. Yeah. I didn't um, see any, maybe that's like a higher that. difficulty thing. I don't know. Yeah. Which a difficulty I probably would not touch. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's not, uh, Justin Horman in the chat said he's beaten it eight times. Wow. Eight including times. the including Village of Shadows difficulty, which he said was kind of hard at times, <laughs> something like that. Um, so yeah, clearly there's people that have uh, d- dived into this with both feet and arms and I'm legs. Trying to do the everything. math on the time. Well, I guess it has been like four days now. Yeah, it's been yeah. out for several days. You could do that, especially if you're if you're burning through like a like a four hour playthrough once you know where you're going. Well, it's like it's I said. Possible. After you get through the first time, you could probably cut your play time in half your second time, and then every time and you says, play it after that. And he says he got it a day early. So that helps. Yeah, that's that's plenty of time to do that. Well, he definitely got his money's worth. Oh, yeah. But he he, he doesn't like mercenaries either. (laughs) Oh, he didn't either. No, I don't. I either did like mercenaries. I had no interest. He hasn't unlocked it at all. Okay. Uh, Oh, and he plays with the new game plus unlockable stuff. So that'll help. Uh, Infinite ammo will help in any Resident Evil game. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, Gray Fox, one point. Thank you for Twitch Prime. If I missed any of you other guys, I apologize. Um, Quickly scroll up here. 
G4 Project Red, thank you for gifting subs to our viewers. Uh, it's awesome. Another reason why you should always show up and watch Game Face Live at twitch.tv slash Sifted Games every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific. All right. Let's move on. I always feel weird when we finally get a new Resident Evil. I talk about it on whatever podcast I'm on at that time, and then the conversation ends. Because I'm like, well, mm-hmm. how long is it going to be until I get to play another one and get to talk about another one? Um, I don't expect DLC coming for Village, like story DLC or anything like that. I don't know. Like, the, you know, Seven had some story DLC. Yeah, like flashback this, stuff. this one, the way it ends, though, they really just kind of set it up. Yeah, but, for... the, but the stuff, the, the other stuff was like flashback stuff. So you could do All early. Right. I mean, you really think they're not going to let you play as Lady Democrats? That so would like be DLC crazy. where you're running around. Something where you're running, you're playing as her, like running around, like killing intruders or something. Or, like, I mean, put her in Mercenaries as a playable character. Yeah, but I, awesome. I, I, th- I think she's so popular, they're going to do something that's going to capitalize on that somehow. They might end like up giving her her own game eventually. Who knows? I that mean, she was that be, popular. Be, <laughs> let's put her in Smash. <laughs> <laughs> that's the next fan petition right there, Kyle. Except, yep. she, except that game didn't even come out for Switch. Although it may eventually. I mean, I think it might work. They might be able to get it to work if they really worked on it. Uh, that would be that would be a cram. That would have to be a cloud thing. I mean, they got Doom Eternal to work on Switch. Doom Eternal's engine is a much more streamlined piece of art than uh, this thing. Yeah, it's a lot more um, scalable for sure. But they could use the cloud solution. They can do that. But I mean, they use the RE engine for Monster Hunter Rise, and it looks really good. Yeah, but you're gonna the downgrade on that's gonna be notable. It'll be drastic. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's move on. What a, we just talked about. Resident Evil Village for an hour and 20 minutes. It's amazing. Well, what else has come out this year? Justin Horman may be able to finish the game in that amount of time by now. Yeah, that's enough That's <laughs> enough time to finish the game on New Game Plus. <laughs> yep. Uh, we're going to go from one game developed in Japan to another. Uh, we're going to talk about Yakuza. Um, Yakuza is a franchise that's really popular on Sifted. I really don't know why. I don't know why people really resonate with that franchise in our audience in particular. Because there's nothing else like it. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. And I'll say this too. So we're working on a new episode of uh, Game Pass or Fail right now. I'm working on it with Vincent. And the game that we're covering is an open world action adventure. And, you know, part of that series is we try to find comps, you know, games that are similar that maybe, you know, people need to decide between before they decide to play the game we're covering. And there aren't a lot of, like, open world action adventure sandbox games anymore. There just aren't. Like, the entire genre has pretty much gone away. Um, But Yakuza was one of the final remaining ones. And obviously Grand Theft Auto, you know, we don't know what GTA 6 is going to look like. I have a feeling it might be more RPG-ish than straight-up action-adventure. We'll see. Uh, But there just aren't games like this anymore, Matt. And what we've learned this week is that Yakuza, which its last entry, which was called Like a Dragon, they had turned it into a turn-based RPG, um, which I was actually surprised that fans weren't more pissed off about. Like, I'll say this. I mean, early on they were, but, like, then they played it. And they liked it. Like, yeah. and apparently the game also did very well because yeah, the Sega, game did extremely well. But so it never cracked the top twenty in sales in the U.S. But Sega, yeah, but it's Yakuza. Like they never do. <laughs> it's but, like they but, did well for Yakuza. It's it, yeah. There's, there's a there's an expectation level. Yeah, I mean it's funny though because Sega like attributed the sales of it to like them having the first good quarter they've had in like three years. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. I went and looked, and like it didn't even crack the top twenty the week it came out in the U.S. Like, yeah, well, Sega's not operating in the same tier they once were. It's, <laughs> I was like, damn, it's all relative. That's crazy though that they were like, okay, this game that didn't even start in the top twenty is like saved our quarter or whatever. Um, and also, not only did it save our quarter, it convinced Sega to continue the franchise forward as a turn-based RPG. It is mm-hmm. no longer going to be an open-world action-adventure like it has been yeah. in the past. I mean, Judgment is going to continue to be the traditional style. But Judgment um, is like an spin-off. Ace Attorney-style game with, like, lawyers and court cases. Yeah, I and... mean, it's a spin-off. I mean, look, man, every single Yakuza game is about a real estate scam. Like, in <laughs> it the end. Is. Like, that's what... I mean, there, there's... It, it, it fits. It's a, it, Judgment is a companion piece sort of spin-off thing, but it does scratch the same itch. Um, I'm fine with that. It does still have, like, yeah. the brawling and... Yeah, yeah, the other part of the announcement was that um, as to 
the direct the, the head of the studio said uh, they're going to be worldwide now releases. Yeah, which like I think we all kind of assumed anyway. Yeah, but like the idea, I mean, there was a point at which we didn't have, even know if we would ever see Yakuza 3 here yeah. in English. And now, like, they're going to do simultaneously worldwide, worldwide, worldwide releases for the future of the franchise. Like, that's a huge turnaround. Like, the, the, the weird turnaround Cinderella story of the Yakuza franchise, especially in the West, is there's a documentary, there's a no clip documentary <laughs> there. Like, if, you, if, if somebody, if, if Dwyer wants to make it, like, it, it's, um, it's extraordinary. Well, I think like, weird it's, it's, it's extra a good funny because to use in general describing this game. I mean, it's extra franchise. funny because like the uh, you know like you said it didn't crack the top 20. Like this is a success story on a level that people generally think success that's not what success is in this <laughs> industry, know, you know? know? Like Yeah. Like it's a it's a very it's a very managed expectations success story. <laughs> and it's fast. It's fast. And I mean, you know, I love these games. I love these games since the first one came out on PS2 uh, back in the day. And so it's great for me because it's, you know, it's like one of the last vestiges of classic Sega. It's just like, you know, this game is like nothing else. It's completely weird. It shouldn't work. It shouldn't be popular, but it is somehow. Yeah. But it's just popular enough to be continuing kind of thing. Like it's, it's classic Sega. Like everyone, you know, as a, as a Sega fan from way back, um, Sometimes it's crazy to think that they used to be in direct competition with Nintendo. It's really bizarre, isn't it? Like, like <laughs> there was a time when this company was the other heavy hitter. <laughs> yes. And they were ahead for a while. I know, like, it's I like, know. It's like, okay. Like, it is bizarre, for sure. But it just shows you how times have changed. And mm -hmm. the companies that are able to manage that change are the ones that have stayed successful. And the ones that have kind of stuck to their guns are the ones that have fallen to the wayside. Like, Yakuza is kind of the spiritual successor to Shenmue in a lot of ways. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's, I think it's definitely become its own thing yeah. after a couple of games, but, like, I don't, th I guarantee you Shenmue was at least referenced in the pitch documents. Yeah, you know, like, oh, for there's, sure. It's yeah. definitely the idea of a Shenmue that actually has action and or interesting like, things in it. Probably the whole pitch was, <clears throat> this is a Shenmue that will sell. <laughs> yeah, it's like this is this is Shenmue, but like somebody because like because like the they both come from like a tradition of filmmaking uh, uh, that we don't have a lot of equivalent for in the West. Like like Shenmue is sort of like the it's 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 a revenge kung fu movie sort of, but it's also sort of the pastoral slice of life drama that like you know there's there's a lot of that element to it too. It's, it's a type of Japanese cinema and like course I did some of those but like you don't think you know they're not seven samurai it's not like we were thinking of when you think of like you know Jimbo that got remade into the you know the the Clint Eastwood westerns and stuff um and then Yakuza is drawing on a, a cinema tradition there uh, that comes out of uh uh the Yakuza papers mainly uh, which is a series of Yakuza historical dramas basically that are very similar in tone and style to the Yakuza games uh, right down to the weird comedy in places, um, but that uh, that series that series is actually the first uh, one of the first or second movie is titled uh, "Battles Without Honor, Honor of, or Humanity," and that is this where the music that plays in the big tea house build up in Kill Bill Part One comes from. You know that that like guitar yeah, riff yeah. thing. That's yeah. where that comes from. Huh. Is that's where Tarantino stole that from? It always sounded like Dick Dale to me, the surf guitar guy. Yeah, like I mean, it's, it, the influence—it's the same era. It's the, the influence is definitely there. The the the, the confluence of, of influences on, of all those things, like kind of feeding off each other in that kind of underground world back then, uh -huh. uh, of like you know the kind of the the the, the auteur cinema stuff like as it as it grew elsewhere. Um, fascinating, like just it's yeah. just fascinating. And and, um, and the, that those, that series, but you can you can find the Ox of Papers, I think, on at least DVD by now, uh, pretty cheap. Um, the early ones deal with the rise of, of what became the Yakuza in the wake of the American occupation of Japan after World War II. Uh, and it's actually a pretty interesting story. Um, but that's where Yakuza comes from. It's sort of that that heightened that heightened drama thing that feels like a soap opera. Well, you know, Yakuza 3 has a scene in the middle of it that's like a 45-minute scene of four men in a, in a, in a room talking about um, real estate de ideals. <laughs> like, the, like it's just, they're just talking about who's making moves on this, and it's just like a blur of politician names and stuff. And it's just, but the thing is, like, if you've gotten invested in Yakuza, uh, certainly that one at that point, because uh, the stakes are high on that in terms of the characters you're actually dealing with and the the existence of like the things that like, have been established in the first two games like you're riveted through this whole fucking it, you shouldn't be like it shouldn't be interesting but it is and like 
I mean, even the big supervillain guy in, in a couple, uh, one of the more recent ones, like his whole thing was like he's going to be able to control the power grid. <laughs> like that's his goal. Like I can turn power off in Camarocho whenever I want, and that makes me God. I'm like, does it? Because it's like five blocks, dude. Like it, it's uh, it's that kind of thing. But it's like the fact that they can make things like that feel like they could be the end of the world is sort of part of the charm. How do you feel um, about the franchise? permanently turning into a turn-based RPG. Are you okay with it? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Like, the, the, the 7 was really good, um, and it kind of made it its own because they switched protagonists. You know, uh, uh, Kiryu's done. Um, and it feels kind of appropriate that, you know, Kiryu is the is the action brawler adventure period, and then this guy's going to be the new sort of turn-based thing. And they, it's like the thing about the turn-based stuff, I haven't finished the game. I haven't played a whole lot of it because I waited for it to come to next-gen, you know, because all my... I play it on PlayStation, and I have a weird thing now where I'm like, okay, they're all just gonna be PlayStation copies because uh, that's just what I've always played this thing on. Um, you, you, if only for continuity of controller shape, you know. Yeah. And um, <laughs> uh, and so I'm, I played a fair amount of it to see, but like, you know, yeah, I got bogged down in things, and I don't have it. You know, in the middle of that period of the uh, of the pandemic, I had no attention span. Um, but like, it works. Like, it, it differentiates it. It makes the character its own thing. Um, and I think they, the other interesting thing is like, they don't just replicate Yakuza in a turn-based format. They do stuff that the turn-based stuff allows them to do. They could never do in real time. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, so like, I think that is, it. that's what makes it work is they, they see the strengths of each form and they play to them. So I think that's why it works. And, um, yeah, like absolutely. And it's like, you know, if I really want a hit of, uh traditional yakuza there are seven other games plus maybe a couple other there's still rumors that they might be bringing the um the samurai era ones over oh. at some point um which would be great because i have both of those in japanese but i would just certainly prefer to play them in english one day um and the, there's this the stupid zombie one um yeah, I which about is, that one which is terrible but also kind of fun um and then judgment's there if i want to you know a current thing they're doing another one of those too yeah, so um, you bring that up, like, as they announced that Yakuza is now going to be a turn-based RPG for the foreseeable future, they also showed the first trailer for the second Judgment game. Did yeah. you play Judgment? A little bit. I have not touched it at all. It's, uh, it's like, it's what you said. It's, it's like Yakuza with more legal stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's got, it's got an Ace Attorney flavor in places, um, so instead of being kind of the the Yakuza thug running around sort of solving problems with your fists, uh, only trust your fists. Police will never help you. Um, the uh, kick faces. The, That's what yes. The trailer says kick faces. <laughs> this one is more. The, the judgment has more like you know you you are doing things on behalf of clients and stuff. It's it's you know, someone who also likes Ace Attorney stuff. It's it's I'm into it. Well, you're like uh, gathering like evidence and stuff. You're yeah. like taking photo surveillance photos. Yeah. You're searching environments for clues. It's a little more exploration based. It's a little more, yeah. um, you know, it's if if it's if Yakuza was too much running around just punching and kicking people all day, uh, Judgment has a lot has has a better balance of like the more cerebral stuff. Um, I don't know if I call it, maybe not cerebral, but exploration stuff. Um, and clearly, like to, to me, the announcement says to me is okay. We're we're basically turning the franchise into a dual pillar situation where judgment is going to be the action oriented one, which is funny because judgment is way less action oriented than the main series was. Why wouldn't they and just then, make the new game, the turn-based RPG one? Like it's so weird to like change the franchise that people know and expect a certain thing from. Because and after making seven, eight, nine of them, they wanted to do something different. And that's not even counting the spinoffs they made with uh, different, like, like the Fist of the North Star they did. But why couldn't they just the alter thing? Yakuza to this, where it's like you have this investigative stuff that you do instead of, like, I don't because know. You're, because weird. he's not Yakuza. Yeah. He's, you're right, because now you're the good guy instead of the bad guy. Yeah. He's not an anti-hero, really. He's sense. just, I mean, he's kind of an anti-hero because he's sort of a twit, but like, <laughs> but he's not, he's not, like, he's on the side of the law, basically. Yeah. Um, and Yakuza is about, you know, the, the gangs. And um, yeah, the change. I and mean, look, the, the the change worked. Like yeah. people accepted it. I guess. It, I mean, I think what we've discovered through all this, Matt, is that people who are afraid that the Yakuza games could go away should probably stop worrying. Because yeah, I think if, they're they're good. If they can, the if the being. game does not make the top twenty in the U.S. and Sega's over the moon about it, 
you're good. They're not going yeah, away. Yeah, knows. I mean, I think Sega knows what the potential of the ceiling is on these things. And yeah. also, like, they can't cost that much to make. Like, yeah, they you are. You wouldn't think. Although they're pretty big, some of them are. They're pretty big, but they reuse the same map every yeah. time. Like, they're basically, like, every every few years, you got to pay money to remake Kamurocho in a new engine. And that's about <laughs> it. Like, yeah. it's, everything else is just plugging content in. Yeah, it's true. It's almost like an expansion. So anyway, like a couple of like, the Yakuza 5's biggest expense might have been the music licensing. Like it really, there's yeah. moments where it really felt like they were churning these out. And luckily, the the, the, the key is that the writing stays strong. Um, Wasn't uh, it the and, last Yakuza where one of the voice actors got in like all kinds of trouble and got arrested on like Japanese TV? And yeah, that was uh, that was <laughs> I think that was six. That. I think that yeah, it was six. I believe five uh, or six. I can't remember which one it was. But yeah, he got he got arrested for drugs and they replaced him yeah. in the game uh, because drug drug charges in Japan are very very serious. Yep, don't ever take any weed to Japan, people. You may go to jail for the rest of like your life. Like almost any other scandal is fine. Like, you'll get right, but if someone gets arrested for like cocaine, like they are basically erased from history. Yeah. Like, it's, the crazy it's part astounding. too is that not all that long ago, you could go to Japan and buy magic mus- mushrooms in stores. Mm-hmm. They sold them legally. Like in the same stores where they sold like used panty. Japan is so weird. <laughs> it just really is. Go there sometime if you can. I highly recommend it. But anyway, that's the latest on Yakuza and Judgment. Both still alive. One just being changed pretty drastically. But uh, people, I feel like people have already accepted the change. The last one did pretty well by Sega yeah. standards anyway. So, all right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about Metroid. Um, Matt and I have been lamenting for a while now, that Metroid is the step- red-headed stepchild of Nintendo IP. Um, they do all this special stuff for Mario and for Zelda, and Metroid just kind of falls by the wayside. This year is a big anniversary year for Metroid, and to this point, Nintendo has done pretty much nothing for it to celebrate it. And, and, and they are continuing to do nothing for it. And it appears that what a lot of people were hoping for to celebrate it is has basically no chance of happening. So this week, a former Retro Studios developer, and I believe the creative director on Prime, basically said that the chances of a Prime collection, a remastered or whatever collection of Metroid Prime games, the trilogy, will likely never happen. And he said the reason is because that basically the way they built those games, there's no way to just kind of port them over and make them look better, that they would have to completely rebuild all three games. Matt, does that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, look, the way you got to collage some of this together on the custom hardware they had, um, you know, could easily be a thing, you know, sort of like, you know, not as extreme as the cell processor, but the GameCube and the Wii had their design quirks. Um, The other thing that strikes me of what he said is that um, to make it look better, like, so that to me says, like, if you wanted it to look up to quote unquote modern standards, you basically have to remake them from the ground up. Uh, that doesn't really mean the same thing as if we wanted to just port them over. Just have a dirty port, you mean? Yeah, just do what, you know, just do what uh, basically what Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance just did. Yeah, because what I don't um, understand about it, Matt, is like there have already been Wii games. Super Mario Galaxy was in the Mario collection that was just released to celebrate Mario's anniversary. Why mm-hmm. would at least Metroid Prime 3, also built for the Wii, why would it not be able to do the same thing? I don't get it. Because code is different between different projects. It just in the same way that, that Nintendo In the same way that, like, resident, you know, same way you'll never see a Red Dead Redemption 1 uh, PC port. Yeah. Because they had to do what they had to do to get that thing to work, and then they don't want they don't want to go through the trouble of getting it to work again on something else. I mean, call me like, crazy. You know, I would Prime... just assume that Retro would be more advanced in how it coded things than Nintendo in-house was i wouldn't necessarily place that bet because I mean, apparently you never, not <laughs> you never know what well because you never it's not i'm not saying they were bad at it or they did anything wrong they did what they had to do to get that game to work on that hardware like that and like the, the, you're not thinking about future proofing something for a different hardware architecture you're just trying to get your job done yeah so, i mean i get why it may have ended up that way but i'm just i don't know to me i would think that retro's code would be the cleanest of them all and like built with like scalability in mind and blah blah blah. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised if that. Nintendo's games 
didn't take that into consideration at all. But retro, Metroid Prime, Metroid Prime got finished on the, by the skin of its teeth with Miyamoto breathing down their necks, having been tearing apart and put back together three times. Like that thing probably barely functions. Yeah, I mean like, the first two I get, they're GameCube games. Really, mm-hmm. what I'm kind of fixated on is Metroid Prime Three, which is well, great. Who gives a shit about Metroid Prime Three? I love that um, game. I love Metroid it's, Prime it's, Three. That's my least favorite of the three. It's specifically because it has motion controls. Uh, um, you give me a Metroid Prime 3 in a collection that has no motion controls, I'm happy. Yeah, but they probably they may would or may if they ever did it. They, isn't, yeah, I mean, if they had to go through this amount of trouble, they would probably would just basically re- retool it like that. And you run into the problem, you know, the Metroid Prime trilogy came out on the Wii, which is obviously similar, you know, basically two GameCube strapped together, as they used to say. Uh, and then it came out digitally for the Wii U. Um, but now we're in a different hardware architecture world. And, it, you know, it might be a Nintendo thing. It might be like, well, we don't want to just release... Um, you know, and, and, and you know, a, a, an up version of the games that, that runs on, hard, you know, even though that's exactly what we did for the Mario games. Yeah. Um, we didn't even add widescreen to Mario 64. I mean, it feels like you could do a quick and dirty some sort of thing. You might be running into the problem of like um, uh, controls. Uh, you, you you have a problem of the 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 clicky the clicky analogs triggers you know, on the GameCube yeah. that like can't really be replicated. Um, that kind of thing. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, also, part of it might be just like, look, I'm, I guarantee you, if you throw enough money at some, you can figure it out. And Nintendo just doesn't want to do that for Metroid. Like this, it's just Metroid doesn't matter to them in the way that like something like Zelda or Mario would. And, and Mario, time, bar- Mario barely got ports. Yeah, like, you I know, know. It, it, that was you know bare fucking minimum that Mario collection. So but we did get three Mario 3D platformers for Switch. I mean, oh sure, but like. The idea that they would even if they that's the effort they put towards Mario. Yeah. Samus ain't getting nothing. I feel like we're at the the danger zone here. If we get through E3, which by the way is starting to shape up into something pretty good. Um lots of announcements this week about E3 2021. Again, pretty much everybody is involved except for PlayStation. And you could maybe yeah, people are not at least people are not spreading it out across a month this time. Yeah, it's actually happening like during E3 week this week, which is yeah. great. I mean, I liked it kind of more spread out because it gave more you know time to focus on each thing. It helped but, with the show, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but doing it in the sense of like everybody on being on board for the same week, like at least makes it feel like an event. Yeah. But I feel like if we make it through the E3 period and we don't hear anything, I don't think it's happening. I don't think anything's happening. No. I, I, I think it's, you know, in terms of like a 25th anniversary Metroid thing, yeah. yeah, like I don't think anything's, maybe you'll get like a Samus helmet in Animal Crossing or something. Right, like the, something goofy yeah. like that, a cosmetic in some other game. Like I'm, I, it's, I, look, either we get, I mean, I don't think Metroid Prime 4 is coming this year. Um, I don't either. I definitely so, don't think that. Um, so I, if there's no kind of collection in terms of, of um, you know, and of course they could be lying to keep a surprise you know, quiet or something, but yeah. that doesn't seem very, like why would you even mention it then? Um, so, like, you know, the only thing we really have left would be like a new Mercury Steam, uh, you know, 2D game, like like, like the Samus Returns remake, mm-hmm. um, or like I guess you could do like a collection of of uh, redone 2D, you know, of, of like Zero Mission and Fusion and Super, but like a lot of those are you know like Super is available on the Super Nintendo, you know, online, you know, the the Switch app thing. And the original Metroids on the NES one, like it feels a little redundant. Um, I guess it'd be nice to have uh, Fusion and and uh, Zero Mission on a switch on a switch uh, in some form. Um, if Mercury Steam did that, or Mercury Steam did their original an original Metroid game, that'd be fun. Like that's the only hope left, really, is that whatever Mercury Steam is doing is some kind of Metroid thing. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. If if we get no announcements about Metroid uh, at E3, we're just, there's. If we get no announcement, it's about Metroid at E3. Returnal is your 25th anniversary Metroid <laughs> celebration. I mean, I still remember Met- the first Metroid Prime. Literally, consensus, 10, perfect 10 out of 10. Yeah. I actually never got to review it because I was working at uh, GameSpot at the time, and Greg Kasavin reviewed it, and he gave it a perfect 10. Um, it's just, and then they saw the sales, and they're like, mm-hmm. wait a minute, if we have a Metroid game that its Metacritic average at the time was like a 10 and they still didn't sell hardly any copies of the game. It didn't move any hardware for GameCube. I feel like maybe the writing was on the wall then. And since then they've just been like, you know what? We got to put out 
something here or there to keep the fans happy, but it just doesn't seem like Nintendo's all that motivated to support the IP. It just doesn't. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, well, I mean it's it's not like a it's not one of their blockbuster things. And as we've seen, you know, unlike Sega, uh, if something underperforms to any great degree, there is a good chance it will go into cold storage, no matter how popular it is. I mean, when was the last F Zero game? Right. Hmm? Yeah. Like, and it's not like that. It's not like the GameCube F Zero wasn't well reviewed or popular. That you know, also like ended up at like a nine point five. Yeah, or whatever. that game was yeah. great. It's also remember, hard as nails, but <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I remember we, you and I went to the reveal event for that. Yeah, and like played it. I remember we played it, and came back like together after, and we're just like, what the holy shit! Like this game is amazing. Oh, no, like, I mean, technologically, like we, it was like yeah. beyond anything that the we, music was amazing. And yeah. like that, and that game went away. You know, they, they had the it was they had the A and the G, the AX and the GX is the arcade version and the GameCube yep. version. You could like take the memory card and like turn, yeah, continue your save i still have the bag one. from that event the f-zero gx bag that they gave us i use it for my hockey bag i carry all my yeah. hockey equipment in. it's just and then like that's it like there's no more no more f-zero yeah it's just disappeared like, so there, look, there's still ip out there that's a switch can no, still yeah. jump where on the, you know where the hell is pikmin for like yeah, it, you know, it's, it's <laughs> seriously i think I all those rumors were wrong what nintendo's doing done. here you know there's no word we're going to do more new IP. I cool. Give me another Metroid assholes. Like, what are you doing? Like, uh, yeah. it's, it's very frustrating as a, you know, Metroid is probably my favorite Nintendo franchise. Um, or I, I think it is like, I've, you know, when was the last time we got, you know, I get to play one about once every 10 years, but, uh, mm, you know, Metroid, the Metroid primes, uh, Metacritic is still 97. Yeah. Well, right now we're watching, the B-roll is the open, the beginning of Metroid Prime. And every time I see footage of this, I remember when I got to play it at E3 for the first time. And that was back when the first day <laughs> the press got in for like, what was it, three hours before everybody else or something? Yeah, I think that's right. And so I ran straight to Nintendo's booth to play Metroid Prime. Of everything at the show, that's what I wanted to play more than anything. And so I ran to Nintendo's booth, jumped in there, I started playing and I started hearing commentary over my shoulder like, oh, good, or look over there or whatever. I turn around, it's Ken Lobb. <laughs> people may not know who ken lobb is but he he was a legendary nintendo developer but one thing i do you i am sure you do remember is the clob from goldeneye mm-hmm. that was named after gun. ken lobb <laughs> ken lobb was kind of like the scott Rody at nintendo back in the day he was a guy who kind of wrangled all the first party content and communicated with people like reggie to be like, well, this game isn't close. Like, this game's almost done. He kind of worked with all the first party games, at least in the Americas, and then some of the stuff in Japan. But if you really followed Nintendo back then, Ken Lobb was like a legend. And mm. uh, I turned my shoulder over my shoulder, and there he was, like guiding me through the Metroid Prime demo. I'll always remember that. Now he works at my, Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, my, my main Ken Lobb and, uh, memory is uh, he came by the office to show us Grab by the Ghoulies. No, oh, yeah, because um, he went to Microsoft with Rare. He was yeah, also he, Rare. he was the shepherd for all of Rare's games as well. Yeah, and uh, that's why they named the gun yeah, the, the worst clock. gun in Goldeneye after him. Yep, as a joke uh, on him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he they showed grab by the ghoulies and they you know demonstrated the game and then there was like a it was like a mini game where you had to like kick goblins into a ball or like a basket or something. I don't remember what it was. You had to defeat a certain number of goblins or something like that. Little things. Yeah, that and, game was so uh, ghoulies. bad. And uh, they had like a record. He's like, the, the record on the dev team is this. The record for the for press on the tour is this or something. And he's like, we want to try. And like Adam was like, Matt, you do it. And yeah. so I did it and I beat the dev record by like eight. Wow. And he just sat there like, what the? That's amazing. What? Like, what the hell? Because back then, and Rare's like, players were good. Yeah. And then later and then later on, uh, like he really like there was a weird reaction to that from him. And then later uh, I found out from one of the one of the other people who was there um that like for the rest of the tour he just kept talking about the guy the the, the, the tech, TV tech tv guy <laughs> the tech tv guy broke all the records and he's so they're so up like the the team's like oh we gotta reset that yeah we gotta like beat that now like it was That's funny. it was it was like a not a barrier anyone expected to be broken by some rando uh rando on a tech tv show um but uh that was that was good time. he's a good dude he was a, he lot is of fun. a really really good dude and it's a shame that nintendo lost him but when yeah when microsoft bought rare he went with rare and he's been there I, ever since i just want i looked up the metacritic for Met- metroid prime just to see for that and i want i want to read a little sn- snippet of this user review from december 4th 2002 which is responding i remember that i remember there was a review i can't remember who wrote it but it it, it basically started or ended it said say goodbye to halo 
<laughs> because this game makes Halo irrelevant. And there's this user review here from December 20, 2002 that says, no, I cannot say goodbye to Halo, you stupid moron. Where is the multiplayer, biznotch? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty And great. that is the most 2002 comment you will hear today. <laughs> That's biznatch. Definitely from biznatch. 2002. <laughs> So there you go. Look, if you're crossing your fingers for Metroid or anything Metroid related for this year or in the foreseeable future, because I think Metroid Prime 4 is still like two years away, to be honest with you. Yeah, if you'll, I've, I mean, I will be pleasantly surprised if we're playing it for holiday next year. Yeah, you better pray to your Samus Amiibo during E3 that we get an yeah. announcement because otherwise it may be a long time coming. It's, it's a shame. just so it's like nothing. Like, really nothing? Like, okay, Metroid Prime Trilogy Collection is unfeasible for the amount of money we're willing to spend. Like, s- give me something. I know. Give me, give, me, give me ports of the Game Boy Advance games or something. Like, give me a version of Other M that isn't garbage. They I don't may know pull if that's something like that out of their ass. For that'll be, that'll be what I get. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be a remaster of Other M. Or it like, won't even be remastered. It'll be a release, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I, I'll take that for Metroid yeah. Prime. Like, even if it's like... Here, okay, here's a Metroid Prime trilogy thing, and if, if you want to play it properly, you got to buy the GameCube controller add-on for the system. Like, fine, yeah. I'll do that. Like, I'll, I'll 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 shell out money for an extra controller to play one of the greatest games ever made. I'm good with that. Yeah, but I, most people I wouldn't know. though, and that's why Nintendo will never do it. I mean, the, <laughs> the answer ends up being take this new my new uh, my new retro bit HDMI converter for the GameCube. And play the play Metroid Prime on that. Yep, like that's, that's, really what, I'm, that's what I'm gonna you do. You can get that just, for like thirty bucks as well. So oh, this is like fifteen on Amazon. It was nothing. Hmm. It was it was, but it it does it goes right out of the digital AV output and does a as an HDMI into the TV. It looks great. Oh wow! All right, so that's the latest on Metroid. Next, we're gonna talk about Fable, game that was when was it announced first? Matt, was it E3 last year? That was last year. Yeah, I know it was last year, but was it E3? I mean, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was, or whatever passed for their E3 equivalent press con. I mean, they haven't been at E3 for a while either, technically. Yep. Well, um, you may remember that the new Fable is not being made by Lionhead, which no longer mm-hmm. exists, and it's not being made by Peter Molyneux, who works on mobile No games longer now. exists. <laughs> like, <laughs> we haven't heard from Peter in a while. Like he's after twenty. Peter Molyneux may and... no longer exist. I mean, I'm friends with him on Facebook, so he does, in fact, he yeah, is still I, alive. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've, I see him on Facebook. It's like, Man's got other things. I mean, he he be put in his time. He did. Yeah, he's oh he was always older than a lot of the other developers yeah. as well. Like, well, also he he revolu- he created an, a a development industry in Guildford, uh, in 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 England. Like that town was nothing in that regard when he was he he started uh, Bullfrog there and everything. You know, Guildford's like a little minor hub of game development now. It is, yeah. and it's entirely because of him. Yep. Like and everyone there, like any you talk to any game dev there, almost at least for well, like ten years ago, it's probably more people come from outside now. But at the time, uh, anyone you talk to, they started there, or they they or they started at his company and then moved on to another company or founded their own company. Or like I only got into the game game development uh, because I was working some weird like, dead end thing here in Guilford, and I and Peter Molly who helped me get a job at this other place. Like like he is a saint to those people to some degree because it's like he change that town yeah like it's 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 amazing like, like he has a you know whatever people think of him outside of that that town you know, wherever everybody wants to call him a liar or whatever like he has a legacy that no one is going to be able to touch I mean, among the people I, I still who are respect in that him, town i'll be honest oh absolutely despite the fact that he is a liar let's just be honest like i <laughs> i mean i he called is, him he is a salesman at it the was very the, least. the whole milo thing was a big lie mm-hmm. i called him out on that literally matt that was like a wizard of of oz moment for me i was saw it at some pre e3 event and they all made <laughs> us sit in this little room and watch this demo that they did and after it was over everybody left the room I was just like chatting with some like Microsoft PR person and literally somebody pulled the curtain back and there were people sitting there with controllers like mm-hmm. controlling the the demo. And then I went on invisible walls and I just told everybody and that blew up like you can still like google like Milo and my name will come up for it's like the person who exposed it was a fraud. And yeah, then we, uh, the when I, when I last time I was there or last the last time I was in Guilford uh, we, Adam and I were doing interviews at various places and we were doing one there for Fable 3. And we, we were there the day after they canceled Milo. Mm. 
like Melanie wouldn't even see us. He Thanks, was so Shane. upset. <laughs> I, I busted the lid open on that one. The PR person was not happy about it either. Yeah, I mean, that... I mean, this was a way. This is like almost a year after that, but like clearly there had been trouble. Yeah, like, the, the PR uh, person saw that I saw it, and he goes, "Can you not report that?" And I was like, "No chance." And he's no. like, "And he's like, I get it." And yeah, I, but I mean, went on invisible that, that walls thing, the next day and talked about it, and that, that was thing it. Struggled we on. We never for... saw Milo again. <laughs> well, I mean, they it. were still working on it for another nine, ten months after that, but yeah. and then they they just it was it was uh, March or April. Yeah, we never uh, saw it again though. And they killed it, and uh, that was kind of the end of that. And there was like a whole there's a lot of drama surrounding a lot of that. Where like you know some people of the company thought it was stupid, and, like it was never going to work. Yeah, uh, those people were correct. Uh, <laughs> it's like other people yeah. that like, believed in it. It was a, it was a whole thing. Um, but, uh, my, my Peter psychologist Mal- mentions that hello games is in Guilford. Yeah. And that's what we were getting at is that Molyneux is not working on this. It's being made by a new studio called playground games mm-hmm. and they are known for the Forza franchise. And we learned this week that the game is being built on the Forza engine. Matt. Mm-hmm. Do you remember what the humans looked like in Forza Motorsport? Well, I mean, I remember what they looked like in Forza Horizon. Uh, yeah, great. I'm sorry. In Forza Horizon. Do you remember what the humans looked like and how they interacted? And Yeah. It was not good. No, but because there was no focus on it. I mean, this trailer that we're seeing right now, by the way, is all CG. Um, mm. This is just like a teaser trailer for the new Fable, and it's all we've got of it so far. Um, do you have faith? Or do you think it's a good idea to develop a game like Fable on a racing game engine? And granted, yeah, because the, that because racing the game en- looks damn good, but... Yes, because the, the engine doesn't mean anything in that regard. It's not, it's not a racing game engine. It's just an engine. Like, a racing game isn't any different from anything. It's just, it's just a camera stuck in a world going a certain speed. And if you just make it walking speed, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Fable game, I guess. Um, my concern is more about the content... Um, I'm not worried about the engine. I'm not worried about the tech. Playground Games has proven that they are extremely adept in tech. Uh, my concern is uh, the world and the story and kind of the the trappings of it. I'm not saying Fable's ever been, you know, stellar in that regard. Um, I think Fable is, uh, as much as I like all three of them in their own ways, I think Fable is sort of a story of unrealized potential more than anything else. Um, you know, not that I expect it to be, you a know, wish the game and a that, dream. It's yeah, not that is. I expect a game that uh, that uh, Molyneux described at GDC. Uh, I was there for that, the the the, the where he announced Project Ego and and talked about the acorn being planted and growing into a tree and all yep. that stuff. I was in the room <laughs> for that. I, I remember, that. and I remember going back to to the office the next day because I was the only one who stayed that late to see that because I wanted to see him talk. And I went back and I told, I said everything. I remember Adam saying, Adam said something like, Cesar was like, he's like, uh huh. <laughs> he's, like, he's like he's like i love the man but uh-huh people wanted to believe <laughs> oh yeah i was I, and well, here, okay here's the thing about him he will make you believe like when you talk to is, him you're right he's very he has a reality distortion field that yeah. like 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 when people talk about like describe like what steve jobs could do molyneux has that like that was my 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 story of that is always going it was another gdc for fable 2 we're doing an interview for fable 2 and i just played through fable 1 as pure archer, like I, I didn't use any melee weapons, which is very difficult. And um, we we're setting up for the for stuff and 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 to do the interview. And uh, I told him that I just done that, so I'm excited. And he turns to me, he's like, he's like, if you love that, then you are going to love this button right here. And like he points <laughs> at the Y button on the on the 360 controller, and is just a, it's like this button. Everything that you need to do in terms of ranged is just going to happen. You're going to tap it, and there'll be a comment. I'm, and I'm just sitting there, like, "Oh wow!" And like we walk out, and we, after we do the interview, we walk out, and and uh, Cesar's like, "It's like, what were you talking about Peter, with Peter there? He seemed pretty wrapped up in things." And I'm just like, "Oh, it's just." A, and I was like, "Well, he was just telling me about you know because I was playing a, an archer, and, and I'm like, he just spent five minutes telling me that the Y button shoots." <laughs> That's it. That's the only thing he said that whole time. The Y button is how he that said was, it, Matt. That was, but I was convinced it was the most brilliant thing anyone had ever done on a controller before. Like that is Peter Molyneux. That's like, a good he, way to he is, it. it is astounding. Like, yeah, it's 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 like it's like um, I don't know. It's like it's like some Star Trek character who can just make you trust him with his voice. It's just crazy. <laughs> Matt, um, I'm I'm not as confident as you that the Forza Horizon engine 
is going to guarantee that a, a game like Fable is going to look and run well. I we've had this conversation before, and I don't think I don't think your handle on what engines do is really accurate. I, I mean, don't, I have I don't a great think... handle on what engines do. I look at what the Forza Horizon games do, and they draw a long draw distance, but there's not that much detail in the worlds. I mean, they're just basically flat. Mm-hmm. I'm going to guess that the world for Fable is not going to be as big as uh, what they're doing in Forza Horizon because you can't run that fast. So, I mean, maybe you get like a really super fast Pegasus or something. I don't know. But I'm guessing you're going to have a world that's going to be substantially smaller than Horizon um just by nature you know it's sort of like how you have to have a bigger world because you go so fast um you have to be able to drive um the concern about like you know making modeling uh, believable humans is yeah. uh is a real one um i don't know if we can fully judge that because the human models just don't really matter in forza horizon that much they have gotten better uh if you go back to forza horizon one you're like oh my god what am i like it's like store mannequins like like jerking around trying they're to, not that much better um, in four i mean uh i mean they're fine like they're fine for what they are like the, it's it's not anything that like you give an award to but like it's it gets the job done like i have to imagine like once they're not spending all their time like building accurate car models they can focus on the on the humans a little more um the big X fact, the X factors for this game in terms of what Playground does. I'm not worried about them being able to do the tech. I'm not worried about them being able to like make that engine work in that context. Like it's that's that's a non that's a non concern to me. My concern is again the story, the writing, which is you know I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call a Forza Horizon games writing tour de forces. Again, they don't need to be, but it's not like they've really you know it's there's not much there. We, dude, we don't, combat's a the, real concern for me. Getting combat there, to feel right is like something that takes a long time. Yeah, and like it took it took them two games in Fable to get it to work right. And really, it still like, felt a little. Floaty. Yeah, I mean, I think Fable three more or less figured it out. Um, they had it down uh, in terms of kind of the the act of the combat stuff. They just didn't quite have the rest of it down. Like it. Like, I don't know. Like, the, the thing you, you forget is that, like, Fable never really was particularly open world. Even though they had kind of promised that from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was it was always large areas, but, like, there wasn't much to do. Yeah. Like, you, like areas were just area, things you went through to get to the next breadcrumb. Yep. Um, they were not open existing worlds in any real sense. Um, to do that with Fable would be an interesting way to expand it. Um you know, the X factors to me are more in terms of um, it's not tech. It's uh, it's the intangibles. It's the how does it feel? It's the how does it how does it it talk? How does it uh, communicate? You know, my expectations um, for this game are pretty low. I'm just going to be honest. Like I I am not expecting it to be a great game. I hope I'm pleasantly surprised. But this is not going to be one of those games where I finally get to play it and I'm like devastated by it because my expectations for it are not very high in the first place. So yeah, I mean, like I said, Fable to me is more of a uh, an unrealized promise. Uh, not in the sense that like, oh, he lied, and it's not like that. I mean, like the Fable games have the potential. The Fable concept has the potential to be way better than any of the three games we've gotten so far. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying it's like, oh, you made shitty games, or you. Be- I like all three of the games, but I was like, you play those games and you see the potential. And if you really put, you know, if you really took, you know, kind of broke away from this weird sort of, I feel like they were hampered by what the original idea for the game was, which did not come from Molyneux, I should I should note. Like the, the Fable originated with Big Blue Box games, which then got bought by Lionhead mm-hmm. and the project was absorbed uh, into it. And that was sort of that. Um, but he was so the one who tried to sell it. <laughs> yeah. Well, the irony of it is that... Um, uh, you know, Molyneux ended up being the front man for a game that wasn't even his idea for yeah. three installments. Um, but like, uh, so I, I'm, I'm kind of hoping, you know, I'm hoping we get something that's, you know, I do think that, uh, obviously there'll be a lot of RPG elements, I would think. Um, Fables always styled itself as an RPG, even though it was, you know, had a lot more action adventure to it than anything else. Um, but like you said, you, they don't really make those anymore. Um, like the, the the kind of game that Fable was aspiring to be doesn't fully exist much. No, these it really days. doesn't. And I think if they and made one like that, people would be like, "What the hell? This yeah, feels like I, a game from like 2004." Right. But I think there's a way you can do it to make it. I mean, basically, I would I would template it as like a Far Cry or a Mad Max kind of thing. Yeah. 
um, like an open world, but with RPG elements, but like heavy emphasis on combat and action. Um, and that would be kind of my angle on it. Um, I don't know if that would I mean, be look, successful. Gorilla did it, but as I've said before, there's a reason yeah. why we always use that example because it's like the only example of a studio going from doing one type of game to another and being really successful at it. So not really. I mean, we just we just talked about a game last week that was that. What? Returnal. Oh, well, I mean, it's a shooter from Housemark. That's all they make. But it's a very different approach to the shooter. It is. It's, it's not a twin stick shooter. It's a completely different genre. Essentially, well, I don't know about the completely different genre, but they have never made a third person shooter before. They never made a game where you had to hold down the aim button and pull a trigger and make that feel good. Like Matterfall they, they... is, but it's side scrolling. Yeah, but it's a, it's a, just a different thing. Like it's, it's yeah. the difference between Metroid and Metroid Prime. Like but those, there's they're... more similarities to that than there is going from driving game to action RPG. <laughs> Eh. Yeah, I think you on. I think you I think you overemphasize the idea of genre being the only thing a developer is good at. I don't think like, it's that I, I'm emphasizing. It's what I care about. I care about gameplay more than anything. I care about combat more than anything. Mm. So I am focusing my attention on those elements of a potential fable game. Right. And that is I'm why saying... I am setting my expectations to disappoint. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, well. I, all I will say in form of constructive criticism is there's probably a better way to phrase it than like you guys just make driving games. You can't do <laughs> combat. That's what it sounds like you're saying. Oh. Um, and there's probably a better way to phrase that um, that doesn't sound quite so dismissive of what they've done before. Because um, it's a it's a it's a real concern. Because like I wouldn't I, I would not bring in the idea that they've only done driving games in to my concern. My concern is we just don't know. Like, you know, we don't, we don't know what Playground Games' idea of good combat even is. Like, look, forget being able to achieve what they think good combat is. What do they think good combat is, period? You know, like, that's my question. It's like, or even just like, okay, uh, you know, Playground Games creative director uh, for Fable. Uh, what do you think about Fable 3's combat? Like, what's your favorite, like, action-driven, like, melee combat system right now? Like, you know, like, are you a Platinum Games guy? Are you, uh, you think Nier Automata was the was the, the king of the hill? Uh, do you think Fable 3 was exactly Hopefully what it, it should have been? God of War. That's my Yeah, hope. that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing, the other thing that gives me a little bit of confidence is that Microsoft has shown um, uh, the willingness to pull the plug on things. If it's just not working. I don't think we'll see this game, Matt, until, like, 2023. Um, I think we'll see it next year. Wow. Then I'm really um, setting my stunner to disappoint. <laughs> I, th I think that because we've known that this is in the works for a long time. Like we've known that there's another team at Playground Games doing some kind of action RPG style yeah. thing for like three years. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think this is further along than we might think it might be. I just think they're going to hit bumps in the road because they're just not familiar with making games of this type and blah, blah, blah. So. Maybe, but I also think that Microsoft's sort of, you know, in-house sort of support system is going to be helpful there. It should. And we don't know who they've got on this thing. They might have brought in some ex-Lionhead people or something. You know, we, we don't, you know, That could knows? also be bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, well, you know, well, Fable it's like games weren't coming out on time either, if you remember correctly. They were always well, delayed. Yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, they're in England as well, so it's not yeah. like they can't, like, go hang out with these people and get some some pointers. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, it's – it's. Uh, I'm not as skeptical about it, but like like I said, um, to me, F Fable is just sort of, like, unrealized potential, and uh, if it's good, I'll be happy. If it's, if it's not, I'll be – kind of i guess sort of where you are. it's like i'm I kind of be what i thought you know um i think i am impressed by playground's ability to take a concept and nail it uh in terms of what forza horizon was especially in the sense that they were making they were kind of making a fable style version of forza when yeah. you think about it, like Forza is a big detailed sim and playground's job was to take that and distill it down into an arcade friendly Fun, more fun, quote unquote, uh, romp in an open and world. Important. In an open world, that's yeah. exactly what they did. So yeah. uh, they have a pedigree here in terms of you know I I see why you give them this project to some degree, especially I mean especially because you didn't have a lot of other studios that could do it at the time they started the project up. Now they do but though. Now they do. Yeah, absolutely. They do. <laughs> like 
I don't know. I feel like they jumped the gun on that one a little bit, and now they may regret it. I mean, you got to get something out. Like, yeah. you got to do something. I mean, I could I mean, definitely I understand see, why like, they assigned it to him. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see, like, you get this out, it's fine, it's a good start, and, like, you hand the Fable 2 or whatever they call the next one over to, like, Obsidian mm-hmm. or something, or That's even exactly uh, Ninja getting. Theory. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't mind seeing Ninja. Or you ninja. just I rebrand mind... Avowed into Oh, no, Fable. no, no. You No, they won't do that. I know they chance. won't, but it probably would Avowed is sense. a Pillars of Eternity game. That's more of a Skyrim thing, which is not. You, you, they, there's you need you want your own Skyrim, but I think you also want something whimsical like Fable on top of like, like there's room for both of those things to exist. Oh, no, I agree. Microsoft catalog. 100%. I like the um, tone of the Fable games. That's one thing I like about them the yeah. most, honestly. I mean, the Microsoft catalog is basically empty right now, so just yeah. anything you can slot in is going to help. Yep. But all right, we got to move on. We're going to talk next about the video game Hall of Fame. They announced this year's inductees into the Hall. It always brings up a lot of debate, just like any Hall of Fame. NFL Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You're always going to look at the people who are getting in, look at the people who aren't in yet or the things that aren't in yet, and wonder what is going on. So the inductees this year are Animal Crossing, StarCraft, Flight Simulator, and Carmen San Diego. Any of those four strike you as odd, Matt? Um, Animal Crossing makes sense, but it feels a little recent. Um, I know it's not because it's been around for like almost 20 years. Yeah, I think uh, the pandemic is weighing in heavily on that yeah. selection. Yeah. Um, the other, I mean, StarCraft, Flight Simulator, and Carmen San Diego are venerable, uh, v- uh, venerable, uh, you know, icons of gaming. That's all, that all seems correct to me. So for me, Matt, I'll be honest with you, I had an eye-opening experience this week because I had never even heard of a Carmen Sandiego video game. What? No. How? I don't know, Matt. Like, it's so funny watching What kind of crap schools were you in? Dude, I saw... (laughs) Exactly. I saw Carmen Sandiego, and I'm like, what the flying F? I'm like... I've never played a Carmen San Diego game. I've never heard of a Carmen San Diego wow. game. And then people, like I started reading everyone else's comments and they were all like, yeah, my school had it. And they're like, oh, my school had it. And like, it was apparently this thing at school that none of my schools participated in. Hmm. Yeah, that was a huge, huge franchise when I was, I mean, I'm a little younger than you, but like, yeah, I, I played all the Carmen San Diego games. I never even heard and, of one and before. And she had she had a she had a cartoon series. I mean, I know her a, from that. And there's, a, and there's a game show. I know her from the cartoon. Um, I know kids yeah. still like the Carmen San Diego cartoons. Oh, yeah. But I mean, they all came from the games. But I mean, it, the, the uh, Carmen San Diego as a video game franchise has no relevance to me whatsoever. I didn't even know That's that there were video games, isn't it? Yeah. So when I first saw it, I was like, "Are you effing kidding me, Carmen San Diego?" I'm like. Yeah, I think they made like a shovelware game for GameCube back in like 2000 or something like that. I'm like, how the heck? And then I start discovering that these games were a part of like everyone's childhood but yeah. mine. I was just thinking about them like a couple few weeks ago. I was like, how come no one re-releases the Carmen San Diego games? And I know they're irrelevant now because you'd need the World Almanac from like 1985. Yeah. But like you could include like a PDF or something. Like I, I would love to play those games again in a legitimate. I mean, I know you can probably get them for like you know pirate or abandoned warehouse sites or something. But like I had Where in the World and Where in Time and Where in the Solar System. I think um, a bunch. Of, I played. I, I played those so much that at a certain point I didn't need the almanac anymore. I just knew the answers to all the questions. Like the, that's why I know those capitals of the states is those games. <laughs> Matt, the crazy part about it is like. I didn't go to school in one place. My parents got divorced when I was like three years old, and I bounced back and forth between my two parents until, I mean, pretty much my whole Mm -hmm. adolescent life. I went to schools in three different states. I went to Mm -hmm. multiple schools inside each of those states. If you'd gone none to of school, them had Carmen San Diego. Well, if you'd gone to North Dakota, you would have seen it. <laughs> you know, you know that story. I don't know. The, there is a game. There, one of the games is called "Where in North Dakota is Carmen San Diego," uh, and it was funded by the North Dakota <laughs> Tourist Board. It was like a, as like an advertisement kind of thing. But it, one of the games is literally just where all of North Dakota. Like, there's, like, five places in North Dakota, period. Like, this is, you should be able to find her in North Dakota very easily. But it's, a, it's, like a, it's like a history of North Dakota thing that was sponsored by the state. 
it's fascinating. I had never even heard of them, honestly. Um, They're fun, or they were fun. I don't know what they'd be like now. Um, the other thing about them was it was interesting because they they happened in the you know the mid '80s, and they embraced like the ongoing technology as you went f- further. And I remember one of them, I think it was Time, the Time one was one of the early CD games on Mac, uh, in in our game lab or not game lab, it was a computer lab. But you could play that. That was one of the only things the weird woman who ran the game lab, the computer lab, who thought video games were like a waste of computer power. Um, we, we, we got in a lot of fights with her over that. We, I got pulled up on detention once because we created an install folder for space quest four and password protected it and wouldn't tell her how to get rid of it. And, um, and when the Dean of students found out what happened and he asked how, what we, my friend and I did, we said, we did this, 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 and then she password protected. Then we broke into the password and, and deleted that. And then we opened it and gave it our own password to that. And he's just like, that's so smart. Just go, just go, just leave. Like no, you know, detention for you. That's a, I'm impressed. Go away. And um, but like it, it had like you know photo. You, you remember like it was like uh when they you know when the first CD drives came out and like you could get like the Encarta encyclopedia and it was like amazing. You could see like photos and little videos of things. Carmen San Diego was doing that at the time too, and it was like it was really super cool. Um, yeah, I, 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 that's the thing is like if you didn't grow up with it, you, if you played it now, you'd just be like, this is stupid. It <laughs> this is. is ridiculous. So that, that brings up the question, though, about the Hall of Fame and how they select games and what games should or should not go in there. I mean, obviously, this game was included pretty much purely for its cultural significance. Yeah. Do you think that that's right? Do you think games like that should be in the Hall of Fame? Sure. The Hall of Fame's a joke anyway. Who cares? I mean, like you my, do bring up a good point. Typically, the Hall of Fame for pretty much anything is kind yeah. of a joke. I mean, even for, like, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, like, it feels oh, like yeah. a lot of those are just paid for by, like, record labels, to be honest. Some of it. I mean, look, most stuff, like, uh, the Hollywood Walk of Fame has nothing to do with anything except who can pay for a star. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, people don't I mean, realize get, that those are all paid for. Yeah. Yeah, you got to get it approved by the Hollywood Board of Commerce or something. Like, some, someone in Hollywood has to, Hollywood's government has to approve of it, but, like... So it's not like it's not like you could just like it's not like we could just pay for you to have a star. I mean, maybe we could if we bribed the right person. I mean, you basically but, um, just have to have worked in entertainment is. and have two hundred and fifty grand. Pretty much, and they got to pay a, a yearly fee for upkeep. For upkeep, yep. Um, that's it. Like, it, it is, uh, like because that's what this is actually. Um, you want the the real mark of success on Hollywood Boulevard is if you have your footprints at the Chinese Theater. Because right. that is a private enterprise, and that yeah. is they decide. They're very you know, selective. They're very selective of who gets to do that. Uh, you can't buy your way into a footprint uh, at the Chinese theater. And that's why um, when you the, go to Hollywood, that's where everybody is. <laughs> right. Because that's although not right now, because they won't let you there in there. Um, oh, they won't let you're going you in there see. now. Uh, no, it's all the the walk the the footprint area is all barricaded off. You have, you have you can only go in if you're actually going to see a movie in the For theater. For COVID. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, a there's a we went we went to see Mortal Kombat there and there's a picture of us all outside like the barrier but the guy who took the photo didn't like tilt it up to show the Chinese theater so it just looks like we're in like a DMZ with it's like, like masks you're, you're on stranded and shit. on the side of the <laughs> yeah, interstate or something yeah. it, it just it looks like it's like this is us from the war zone when all the bio agents were running around it's it, it, it's a funny picture but like uh, so um, another thing that I discovered Matt in looking into this because Carmen San Diego just literally blew my mind uh, was that Call of Duty is still not in the Hall of Fame. Do you hmm. think it should be in over any of the games, uh, Animal Crossing, StarCraft, Flight Simulator, or Carmen San Diego? No. No? No. I don't care. Like, I don't care about Call of Duty. Uh, Call, the other thing about Call of Duty doesn't really have a I, – I was going to say like, Call of Duty doesn't really have a face to put to it, but neither does Flight Simulator. Um, but the thing – it is inter- – Flight Simulator is interesting in that, like, you say something as generic as Flight Simulator, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Like, that's sort of the, the iconic – element of that is like Microsoft Flight Simulator for so long was just the benchmark. Like that was, oh, can you can it run Flight Simulator? Like that that was sort of like, what does Flight Simulator look on it? That was yeah. a thing for a long time. I mean, it still um, is, to be yeah. honest. I mean, the oh, fran- yeah, with the new one, the for new sure. one is even more so that way, in all honesty. But you don't think that like Call of Duty has had more of an impact than Microsoft Flight Simulator? Um, 20 some million people buying it every year. For I mean, the what last, does impact like, mean? 18 years straight. Who cares? Like it's 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 the Hall of Fame. It doesn't mean anything. Like they can do it next year, I guess. I don't know. How do they, how do you get in? Like, do you have to be promoted? Like, if it's not I think in, it's it might just like be... a council of people who advise mm-hmm. it, and then there's a final vote on who makes it in or who. Hey, doesn't. for all we know, they said, "Hey, let's do that." And Activision's like, "Nah, fuck off." Like, we don't know. <laughs> like, I mean, maybe, you're yeah. right. There may be some kind of monetary whatever involved or something that's keeping. Yeah, it I don't think happening. you have to pay for anything, but it just feels like you'd probably have to show up. 
And maybe it just seems odd that literally care. the best-selling video game every year for the last 15 years is not in the video game Hall of Fame. Mm. Seems crazy to me. Um, they can cry themselves to sleep on their huge pillow of money. I mean, at first I was like, dude, Carbon San Diego, that's insane. But then once I found out that everybody had experienced it in their life except for me, I understood it. But mm. now, to me, like, Flight Simu- like StarCraft, totally get it. Animal Crossing, I get it. Flight Simulator, Call of Duty should be in the Hall of Fame before Flight Simulator, I think. Eh, I, I don't know if I'd go with that. I will say, um, here's a 2019 uh, inductee that I feel should probably not be there above Call of Duty, which is Colossal Cave Adventure. Yeah. There's one I barely heard of. I mean, uh, the I'm guessing there's thing... probably some really old people on the board. Yeah. Yeah. The other weird thing, if you go back and look through... Um, some of the things that were inducted are are franchises, and some of them are individual games. Um, like the, the yeah, that's that's crazy. Like Madden franchise. Yeah. Yeah. Don Madden's is a franchise, but in that same year, Final Fantasy VII right. is inducted. So it's like, why isn't it just Final <laughs> Fantasy? Like as a brand, as a IP. They maybe looked at it because Madden doesn't change that much from one entry to another. And I get, but then Microsoft Solitaire is in there. So and Mortal Kombat <laughs> is that the first Mortal Kombat or is it all Mortal Kombat? I mean, I'd probably put um, Solitaire in I there guess before it's the Flight first Simulator. Mortal Kombat. I'll be honest. Like I've spent a lot more time with Flight with uh, Solitaire than I have with Flight Simulator. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think they're just picking things that are you know popular and and relevant and you know. The, I was there for the first one, the 2015 one, where they brought in, was it Doom, Pac-Man, Pong, Mario Brothers, Tetris, and World of Warcraft? Like, that's a pretty... It was hard to screw that one up. The first one, it's like, if you can't pick good entries for the first one, you're doomed. It's not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the the list is pretty, you know, that Grand Theft Auto 3, Sonic, Space Invaders, Legend of Zelda, Oregon Trail, Sims, Donkey Kong, Halo, Pokemon, Street Fighter. If, I mean, this is sort of a who's who of... Mario Kart, Mortal Kombat, Minecraft, King's Quest, Centipede, Bejeweled, like, you know. Yeah, I'm okay with pretty much all those. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. And I get. I totally get why a lot of those games made it in before Call of Duty, but. Yeah, and I was, I'm also looking at, like, what's the most recent game on that list is, I think, World of Warcraft. Um, yeah. So that was, that was 2004, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the most recent game on there. So maybe Call of Duty just uh, has to, has to uh as to, as to, uh, well, I think that but, was from the first Call of Duty, Duty has, was before then. Call of Duty has to, has to ferment a little Apparently. longer. That's the other thing is like, which Call of Duty do you put in? Yeah. I would say Modern Warfare. I think you just go with the franchise again, honestly, like you did with Madden. Yeah, we don't want Call of Duty Ghost in there. <laughs> uh, even but you're right. That's kind of like the one exception that you wouldn't want in there. But yeah, I was I would say I was if I was going to do that, I would put Call of Duty Modern Warfare in because that's the one that changed everything. It was. Yeah. I mean, it changed um, shooters, period. Like the whole genre. Yeah. yeah. Like that's, that's the one you that's the one you want to recognize. You have to more pick than one, anything. Absolutely. But I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if they just go with Call of Duty when it finally does go in. Maybe. I, I think I would think they'd go with Modern War because it, it feels like they've gone with individual ones more. Like even the new stuff, like the it's they it's where in the world is Carmen San Diego, not just Carmen San Diego. It's it's yeah. the original Animal Crossing, not just Animal Crossing. Um, oh, it is the original yeah. Animal Crossing. If you look at if you look at the website, it's actually pictures of uh, like the N sixty four game. Uh, yeah. Wow. Or the game the GameCube game. Wait, Animal game- Crossing debuted on GameCube. Yeah. What was Animal Leader? On animal leader yeah that was a different that was a different thing was it yeah i thought that was the first animal crossing i think so huh okay but anyway I, I remember that i remember you uh i remember that that name uh animal leader was unreleased oh so that animal US, leader was it animal uh no i don't think it was ever released it was it was for the 64 dd and uh it says everything here says it was uh unreleased and then Animal Leader was released. Okay, so so the 64 DD one was canceled, and then it was released as Cubivore. Oh, I'm thinking of a different game then. Yeah, Cubivore. I actually it still is called Animal Leader in Japan, and in Japan. I have the yeah. Japanese version of that game. And then you're right, it was changed to Cubivore and published by not by Nintendo when it came to the U.S. It was some other third party mm-hmm. company that published it. But anyway, those are your. New nominees for Video Game Hall of Fame. In the comments, let us know if you agree with the picks, and if you don't, what games you think should be in there instead. I also never do that, like, the whole, like, 
let us know in the comments. <laughs> Get in the comments. <laughs> I'm so terrible at this influencer thing, Matt. I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> um, all right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about Baldur's Gate. Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance re-released this week. It's not mm -hmm. a remaster. It's not a remake. It was literally nope. just re-released. However, it's just it has widescreen now. And isn't it? Does it also display in 4K? Uh, it can, yeah. Yeah, but that's I mean, it. The, the, the assets aren't really up to it, but yeah. it does display in 4K. Have you been playing it in 4K on your TV? Uh, as far as I know, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's hard to tell. <laughs> it is hard to tell. So last night, Matt. I um I've been having problems lately with my Xbox Series X losing sync with my television. I don't know mm. why. Just this week it started, and my is plugged directly into the TV with an HDMI 2.1 cable that came with the Xbox. I plugged it into my TV, and like I'm playing. Last night I was playing a round of Rocket League, and in the middle of the game, it just cut out black, and it just kept happening. So oh, mine does that sometimes. What is that? Um. That I think it's something to do with the uh, the dynamic resolution. It doesn't uh, happen on my PS5 with my TV. No, my PS5 doesn't do it. My Xbox does. Uh, the Xbox One used to do it sometimes. It's something about the way the Xbox handles it. Weird. Uh, the the th the one way to make sure it happens uh, every time, oddly enough, is to load up the HBO Max app on my Xbox, and it will flash black periodically, and it will keep doing it even when I quit the app, and I have to restart the system. Yeah, I mean, it'll go black for probably two seconds, yeah, and then, but then it has to go through the process of, like, syncing again, and literally, yeah. like, I lost a game of Rocket League last night because of that. Like, so yeah, anyway. Yeah. No, it, that, no it, it happens. Usually, usually it's only, like, briefly for, like, a resolution change between certain things, but sometimes it does continually do it, and I have to reboot the Xbox. Well, why I bring this up is because I was like, what the hell? Because it kept happening after that. So mm -hmm. I went in and looked at my console settings, and my console was set to display at 1080p. Mm. And I had, obviously, I'd taken it back and captured at 1080p for whatever game I played last on it. And it doesn't automatically detect that it's plugged into a 4K TV and start broadcasting at 4K. I had to go in and manually set it up, and it, I'll say this, it didn't happen again after that. I don't know if that's the mm -hmm. problem, but there's some kind of a thing going on with the uh the the Xbox doesn't like talking because I think we have the same TV essentially type, yeah the LG yep. LG panel um I there's something about the way the series the, the the Series X uh, doesn't like talking to it the same way I'll, I'll check my settings to see if it's stuck on 1080p as well I won't, I'm curious now the Series X it, also by the way is of the two consoles the one that has the more problems with the 10 the 4K 120 pass through. I had problems mm -hmm. with both. Some people have said the PS5 doesn't have that issue at all. I had the problem with the PS5, but it was way worse on Series X. So I don't know if there's mm -hmm. some kind of a handshake problem with the Series X. I don't know. It, it could be. I, I don't have that problem at all with the PS5. The yeah. PS5 has never done that. Ever. I've never had it happen either, other than when I was trying to send it through my new receiver, it just would like mm -hmm. intermittently work. Yeah, it's not it's not really a big deal. Like uh, the other thing that happens sometimes with the Series X is uh, the HDR stays on when I switch back to the menus. So everything oh, wow. looks really dramatic. <laughs> Matt, <laughs> like, I've also had times where if my Series X went to sleep and it woke back up, it was at 480p when it woke back up. Have you had that happen? That's a new one on me. No, I've never seen that. That's, that's happened that's to impressive. me a bunch of times. Hmm. And it, the only way to make it go away, you can't even go into the menus and change it. I have to restart my Series X to make it go to back to like 1080p mm -hmm. or 4K. So anyway, I've never had that, but it's it's similar. Yeah, I've uh, I've had to restart the system several times to to get it to stop doing the weird resolution stuff. All right. Well, anyway, let's talk um, about. It doesn't Dark really Alliance. surprise me that a game like th that this game would would cause that to happen either, because I'm sure there's a lot of kludgy sh shit happening like, in there in there. Because they this was the definition of quick and dirty. Uh, you know, they, they, there's no there are no bells and whistles on this re-release at all. Um, no online play, no nothing. If it was not in the original game, it is not here. So this game is from 2001. Yep. It uses the third rule set. Is that right? Uh, third edition. Third I mean, edition a, a rough, an approximation, an action RPG approximation of the third edition, yeah. And it is an action RPG, which back in 2001, there weren't a lot of those. In a lot of ways, this game no. is kind of a trailblazer. Yeah, I remember. This is, I mean, this was uh, one of the few Diablo-style games on consoles at the time. Yep. Like there was nothing else like this to some degree. I mean, you had a bad PS1 port of Diablo 1. Um, but at the time, Diablo 2 was about a year old. 
and there was nothing else like it yeah. uh, on consoles. I remember my roommate, Gerald Valoria, who now works at Blizzard, he was reviewing this, and I didn't even play it back then. He was playing it for review for GameSpot, but I sat and watched him play it for a long time. He was a huge D&D guy, and he freaking loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, For some reason, I remembered the game being better received than it actually was. I thought it got like all nines or nine-ish scores. Uh, it didn't get tremendous reviews, but it is very, very loved. Yeah, um, it is. It is, the, it is. it is considered a classic by most people, and I think rightly so. I think it's still fun. Is it holding it up for you? Yeah, I still like it. Um, I mean, look, I actually replayed it most of it last year um, on Xbox, the original Xbox, or maybe it's PS2. Maybe PS2. Um, I have uh, all of them. I mean, because I, I have uh, one and two on both Xbox and PS2. I have uh, Champions uh, of Norath, which is the EverQuest one that uh, Snowblind went on to make after uh, Interplay pulled this away and gave Dark Alliance 2 to uh, Obsidian. And then, um, or to Black Isle, rather. And then I have Champions Return to Arms, which is the sequel to, to Champions of Norath. Champions Return to Arms, uh, I got like for like $9 in a bargain bin when I first moved to L.A., and I never got around to playing it or opening it. And I looked it up on eBay. That thing's four hundred dollars now, dude. This so I was like just searching around. All these inf- games are super valuable because of the nostalgia, dude. It's crazy. I was searching around for information on this game today, and the the Game Boy is it the GBA version? Was that what it yeah. came out? The GBA yeah. version of this game is worth eight hundred dollars. Yep, they didn't make too many of $800. that. Eight hundred dollars. Holy crap, dude! My eyeballs almost popped out of my head and pop down onto my keyboard. I was like, oh my God. It made me start thinking, do I have that? Like, I I don't know. I might. I have a lot of GBA games that are just packed away at this Mm -hmm. point. I might have it. Like, I had no idea. It's so awesome when you stumble across something that you own that you thought was worthless that is worth like a crazy amount of money. It's really awesome. Um, So I've never played this, Matt. Can you just give like a quick overview of, of like the plot and how it plays? Yeah, um, so Baldur's Gate, so Dark Alliance is, uh, it's a, you know, you know, three quarters perspective dungeon crawler, okay. action RPG. And you basically come, you pick a character, you can play as a, an arcane archer who's a human male, a uh, with uh, some kind of, uh, like a dwarven fighter. Uh, you can't create the characters, they're preset characters. So it's like an ar- a male human archer, arcane archer, a male dwarf fighter, and a female elf sorceress, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never played her. She's very hard to play solo. Um, and uh, you, p- you pick the character, and they just you, they come to Baldur's Gate, uh, the city of Baldur's Gate. They get ambushed by, uh, in the middle of the night, they get ambushed by a bunch of bandits and uh, who are working with this weird guy in a fancy helmet. And they 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 take all your money and they leave you for dead and they run off and you wake up in this tavern called the Elf Song Tavern, uh, and where the bartender uh, helped you out and like everybody there helps you out and you wake up and you're like I'm gonna go deal with these bandits because I'm pissed, and they're like well be careful uh, the first thing you should do is go through the sewers because they hang out in the sewers and go through the sewers you have to go through the basement of our tavern and there's a lot of rats down there so there you go so <laughs> if you want so you know it's a, it's literally go into the basement and start by killing rats. Um, and uh, that's that. So, uh, and from there you go down, and you're going to discover there's a whole uh, there's a whole conspiracy thing going on with like there's the the the, the new because the thieves are like this bad new thieves guild that like the good new the old thieves guild is like the honorable thieves, and the new thieves guilds are like murderers, and like the, this is a war between the thieves guilds. And um, so you got to go down and figure out what's going on. And like this guy on the helmet's like working for this like evil beholder guy who's like doing some nasty summoning demon shit thing. You know this. It, you know, it's it's a classic sort of you know fantasy story, fantasy D and D story that sort of starts small and spirals out into like, oh, you better destroy, kill these guys before they destroy the city, kind of thing. Now, is the combat um, like Diablo? Is that how it works? Uh, more or less, yeah. Like it's, yeah. I mean, obviously, you're not. It's not point and click because you're using a controller. Mm-hmm. Um, but you are steering your character around with the analog stick, and you hit the X button to attack and uh, hold it down to attack a longer. And uh, they attack back, and you use health potions and mana potions to keep your, you know, your life and mana up. Uh, and that's that. You find more. It's you know, a lot of loot. You find armor and and weapons, and equip them, and go back to town. Portal back to, to back to the Elf Song Tavern, and sell them off, and portal back, and you know, using potions of recall, which are not scrolls and totally not scrolls of town portal, and you totally can't sue us for that. 
and um <laughs> You, you know, you level up in the same way you level up more or less in, in third edition. Um, you start real weak, you get fat, strong pretty fast. Uh, little increments of up, you know, little increments matter. Um, you know, like being level four and level between level four and level five is, is a noticeable difference in a lot of ways. Um, like, you know, adding a plus one to damage on something will actually kill something much faster. Like, you'll notice it. Like, it's like it doesn't, D&D. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's like... Um, you know, it's like how like we think about a lot of modern uh, RPGs, especially action RPGs. Like, if this thing doesn't up my stats by like a hundred, I don't give a shit. You know, but like on this, it's like no, it's it's very incremental, and but it feels small improvements, but they matter. Like you'll you'll feel more powerful even if you're just shooting an arrow that does like four more damage than the last arrow you shot. Erebus um, Jones says, "Hey Matt, it's not a total no effort port. It's weirdly got rumble trigger support. It does. It has <laughs> it has some really detailed uh, rumble features in it. That's true. Interesting. Um, very f- freaked me out the first time. Like I wasn't I wasn't sure what because it, it'll rumble when like things are happening. It'll rumble when you're low on life, which is good because one of the flaws in this game to me is there's not a lot of feedback, visual feedback." for your life bar dropping because because that's the thing is um uh you know the monsters run on third edition rules too too and third edition critical hits can hurt and like you know if, if you're not paying attention three hits can kill you wow um if they if they get lucky like on their, this, on their under the hood crazy. rolls um so i've died pretty fast you know it's a hard game uh the second boss is probably the hardest thing in the game um the second part, boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in part because of what level you are when you get there. You're like level three or four. Right. And the boss is like, is this is this orb uh that is creating all this undead. You've been fighting all these undead through the whole area, and you get to you have to fight this orb and you, you have to hack away at the orb, and then it floats out of your range and it summons like a whole horde of zombies and skeletons, and you have to fight off like a whole group of skeletons that swarm you. And um, if you're not lucky, if your rolls aren't good, if you're not lucky, you don't have good enough weapons and armor, like you are going to get steamrolled because you got to go through like three waves of that. Um, so that is that is the big crucible. That's that's the that's the the bottleneck of this game is that's that second boss. Um, uh, it, it's it's if you're not ready for it, you're like, what the hell? Because like the thing is, the enemies don't respawn. Um, so it's not like you can go grind for loot oh, or right. something like you. You got to get through it one way or the other. Um but uh did you, beat you can it? play two pl- what did you beat the boss oh yeah yeah oh, yeah i, I got i mean oh, yeah. I, this is not my first rodeo <laughs> with dark alliance um i knew it was coming uh, and i and i knew to like kind of you know, oh this this i this, like one of the weapons like this weapon isn't as good as the other weapon i have but i'm gonna keep this one because it's better against undead right uh it's more suited to the to the task how um, much are they selling this for matt they are selling this for an absolutely ridiculous 30 dollars wow um that's which is lot. almost as much as it cost when it came out. <laughs> um, thirty bucks would not be a bad price if it was both games, right? Yeah. Uh, but thirty bucks is too much for this. For for something that does nothing but give you widescreen and rumble, uh, it is. Um, I think it's an absurd price. I paid it. I'm happy with it. I really like this game back in the day. I like all the, all these games, all four of them. Uh-huh. Uh, I still like games like the, you know, I, I played Chaos Bane when it got cheap, specifically to like kind of scratch the Dark Alliance itch, and it does a pretty good job of that. Um, so I'm not going to tell you to go buy this for 30 bucks if you've never played this before, because unless you, if you, if you are the customer that will, that is correct for paying 30 bucks for this, you already bought it. Uh, the other thing I will I will say that I really enjoyed about this was the fact that they dropped a trailer the day before it came out. Like, so I, I have a friend who's uh, she and her mom and her whole, their whole family really played this game to death back in the day. Like when she was growing up, like uh-huh. they played she played this with her grandma when she was growing up, and they played through everything, unlocked everything, got through extreme difficulty, unlocked Chris Dorton, like all the whole nine yards on this thing. Um, and like when I, I saw the trailer come up on Sifted and I sent it to her and like there was like celebration, like everyone <laughs> like texts of with, oh, my God, it's awesome. tomorrow. Oh, my God. Like squealing in joy, like all through through. It was it was like I've never seen anything I've, and, and got it. And like they've been playing it like the whole time. Like. The, the the love people have for this game is tangible and like um and it was you know and, and i was like i mean it's 30 bucks and she's like don't care like instantly huh. like doesn't matter like how long like is it matt is it like um, a huge game 
it's it's I mean it's not super long in terms of like kind of by these game standards I wouldn't say but it's going to take you a while to get through it because it's hard okay so you're gonna um, die it's going to take you some time and, and then like if you so you get it's, it's you're meant to replay it as well like these games tend to be mm -hmm. so like you you once you go through it, you unlock this thing called the gauntlet uh that you then can go through and once you go to get through the gauntlet you unlock extreme difficulty and if you go through extreme difficulty you unlock Dristo Erden who's a famous D&D character um from the from the R.S. Salvatore books uh, that you can then play as him um and you can play together is a local two-player co-op uh you can also import your character between games uh that was more relevant in the ps2 days when you can take a uh, like a memory card to someone's house and import yeah. your character there and and kind of play with them that way um there's no online play uh because it is just a straight port there was never online play before so there's no on online play in this um theoretically i guess you could try to do like share play on ps4 for like an hour like I, I guess that might work. That'd be annoying though, because you don't want to play this more than an hour. Yeah. Um, Especially if you're spending thirty bucks for it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but in terms of like, you know, I mean, I, having just played it on uh, PS2 last year, uh, this is definitely easier on the eyes. Uh, the fact that it's widescreen is great. Um, and it was, it was, it's, you know, I was. Ho I've said before, I think, on the show, I, like when they announced the new one, uh, I was hoping they would do this. I was yeah, hoping they would mention. do a re yeah. remasters of these because mm -hmm. um, they're so hard to get. They're so expensive now. Um, you know, there's, if for for one, usually I can't remember which is which, but one version of the first game, PS2 or Xbox, is more valuable than the other. And then the other one version, the opposite version of the second one is more valuable. I can't remember which is which, but one is like, I think the I think it's the, the first one. I think it's the the Xbox one is more valuable. I think like the PS2 version, you're gonna pay like 18 bucks used, huh. and the Xbox version, you're gonna pay like 80. Weird. Um, I don't know why that is. And then it's backwards the other way around. I might be wrong on that. I might I might have been mixing them up, but it's that's how it, I know one is valuable and the other is less, and then it's the other way on the sequel. Um, and then both Champions games are absurdly expensive. Um, the uh, and I, well, I was still. I still kind of think this this one's the best one. Okay. I, I think they nailed it the first time out. Um, but you only recommend down... it for people who are already fans. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, if you love this back in the day, totally pick it up. Like it's 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 the exactly what you remember it, except a little bit better. Um, if so you've far? never played this game before, it's not gonna probably change your mind. Um, you should probably just get Diablo three or That's something. That's why we show them B roll, Kyle. <laughs> yeah because you can watch this and you can kind of see what kind of game it is you know? yeah you, you see what you're looking at um and uh the other th the other thing to note is i don't know if the b-roll is showing it because they can't see it but like the water in this game was a big deal at the time oh, i remember like, that actually yeah, yeah the fact <laughs> you could walk through the water and leave like ripples and stuff yep. like nothing did that on i remember consoles. that um Oh, the so, good like, old that days was cool. where stuff like that uh, mattered well, the other thing to note is that the uh this has a stellar voice cast like this is the same voice acting agency uh, as Metal Gear Solid One, so it's a lot of the same characters. The the the, We're the also bartender. We're the water is, right now, by the way. <laughs> yeah, the bartender is Jennifer Hale, uh, who most people will know as uh, either Princess Peach or uh, Femme Shep. Yep. Um, they've got John Rhys Davies is in there as a character. They got this guy who played the psychiatrist in the Terminator movies in there as as a guy. Um, Cam Clark, uh, Liquid Snake, Leonardo the Ninja Turtle. He's in there as a very jumpy priest a couple others uh it's it's a it's a who's who of voice actors from that era which is pretty great uh the other thing you can dig into is um the drama behind this series which is fascinating because no one really remembers snowblind anymore um but they they did some really cool stuff um they did this and they did uh, uh the champions games and they did uh, war of the ring lord of the rings game um, but they, they, this is on a, their custom engine, this, the Snowblind engine, uh, and uh, also called the Dark Alliance engine because it started with this game. And then uh, this was, and then when uh, they did a sequel, Interplay gave the sequel to Black Isle Studios, who then used the same engine. And Snowblind was so mad that I, I'm not sure if they were mad that they got the game taken away from them or if they just like interplay just played publisher and and acted like they didn't get to stick with this series they basically created um but snowblind sued them Jeez. for using their engine for the, for dark alliance 2 and fallout brotherhood of steel uh there's a there's a game no one wants to remember um they made a game like this out of fallout which is famously considered the worst fallout thing ever made um and so they sued them for that and as it was as as snowblind moved on to the champions games 
which are essentially this because Dark Alliance 2 is just basically the same game with a couple more characters you can play. Champions of Norath is a real evolution of what this game started. So those are kind of the two differences there. Um, but in the end, the, the settlement was basically like Interplay wouldn't use the engine anymore, but they could continue to sell the games that they already made using the engine. And then at some point they actually had to transfer the Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance trademark to Snowblind. And then there's a whole bunch of weird nonsense involving the Baldur's Gate trademark, which I believe is why the new one that's coming out next month is called Dungeons and Dragons Dark Alliance and not Baldur's uh, Gate Dark Alliance. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is 30 bucks. Is it only for PS4 and Xbox One right now? Uh, currently, it's just PS4 and Xbox. There is Switch and PC coming later in the on. year. That's what I thought. So there you go. Baldur's Gate, Dark Alliance. Matt only recommends it if you are already an existing fan. Although, if you want to see how action RPGs have evolved over time and you have a lot of disposable income, Yeah, it it's a piece a of history yeah. in a big way. I mean, it definitely is a big piece of history and... You, should, you, you might want to see kind of where all this came from. I do think you'll, you'll probably see it on sale later in the year. Like, this might be a really good Black Friday pickup. Yeah, that's true. Or pick it um, up in a hum humble bundle sale or something like that. Yeah. It's also kind of, I mean, I, I don't want to harp on this like we have, but, like, if you released this, like, two months ago, I might have said get it now because yeah. there's nothing else to do, Yeah, you know? Um, this is a great game, especially if you have someone to play with on, you know, couch co-op. Uh, you'll have a blast with this thing. I think if you if you can if you can accept that it's a twenty year old game, without a lot of bells and whistles in that regard, I think it I think it holds up uh, for the for this kind of genre. I, I think it still works. Okay, all right. Let's move on to our last topic of episode two fifty five. We just got finally tech specs leaked for PlayStation VR two. Up to this point, really all we had seen were the controllers for PlayStation VR two. Um, Sony had announced a couple things, like it had said that you're gonna, it's going to be attached with a single cord, so we knew it was going to be corded, but we also knew that it wasn't going to have as many cords as the first PlayStation VR. And then they did, Sony had just talked about the controllers, and actually I'll just bring up the controllers on screen for you guys. Um, these are the actual controllers, the photos it's, that PlayStation released of the controllers, and they pretty much look like typical VR controllers anymore, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but it does have, like, the controllers do have the crazy trigger technology that is in the dual sense, the haptic feedback, the crazy rumble. Um, they look like they're going to be bleeding edge as far as controllers go for VR, or at least up to scratch with what you're getting on the higher end uh, units from from companies like HTC with the vibe and yeah. things like that. I mean, they're not going to be able, it doesn't look like they're going to be able to detect like individual finger movement, yeah. but, uh, but they're going to be a step up for sure. Yeah, a and, huge then step reappropriating up from the, the move, move controllers. controllers. <laughs> but finally today, or I think actually maybe the news broke yesterday, we have some specs for PlayStation VR 2. This information comes via Upload VR. We always try to give uh, credit to the sources we get our information from. If you want to read the full story, you can go to uploadvr.com or the article is curated on Sifted. In fact, I think it's near the top of the homepage right now. Because yeah, it's it, in the most popular section. Yeah, because it's section. in the most popular module up there. So if you want to see more detail, you can go there and get it. And uh, thanks to Upload VR for doing the reporting on this. Uh, but here's sort of the Cribnos version of their article. The PlayStation VR 2, and that's not what it's called yet even. What do you think they're going to call it, Matt? What about um, PlayStation VR Pro or something? Pro or like, play, I mean, PlayStation VR 4K ah. would be my guess because they're emphasizing that a lot. Great, great segue into the actual specs of it, which is it is 4K. It is 4,000 by 2040 pixels. Um they're going hard. It's more like than this. Oculus Quest 2, which has yeah. become a sensation. Um, it has lens separation, a lens separation adjustment dial. Um, here's really the big thing that could really pay dividends. It has what's called foveated rendering. And basically what that means is it can track your eyes and where you're looking. Mm -hmm. And it will make sure that it's only rendering the stuff that you're actually looking at in full 4K resolution. And that it will kind of blur the objects out of your field of vision that you're not looking at, which can free up tons mm -hmm. of resources for VR, which is but a big also deal. Is a better experience. That's a big deal. That's like one of my biggest complaints about like the Vive was that because it didn't know where I was looking, I could look over to one, you know, if I didn't move my whole head and just you moved with my eyeballs, eyeballs, I was looking at something that was out of focus. Yeah. Yeah. So this follows your eyeballs 
And it's also important because what people don't, a lot of people don't realize about VR is you have to render everything twice. And that mm-hmm. is a huge, huge suck on resources for a console or any piece of hardware that you're dealing with. So this could really make stuff look great without much of a hit on the CPU or the GPU, which is a big deal. Yeah. And that, I again, can tell you where there will be a hit, though. rendering, if you want to remember something from today's game phase. Mm-hmm. And then the kind of the final thing is that there's a motor in the headset <laughs> that can be used for haptic feedback in your head. <laughs> How do you feel about that, Matt? I mean, I guess. As someone who's susceptible to sinus headaches, that might get turned off. Yeah, I don't um, know if I'm too excited about that feature, to be honest with you. I don't know if I want my head, like, vibrating and rumbling, to be perfectly honest with yeah, you. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, like, what... I mean, I guess you could just hit me in the head when I get take damage or something. I guess that makes sense. I don't yeah. know. Uh, that, that'll have to be a case-by-case basis, I think. Yep. Uh, some more details on the controllers as well. Um, of course, they both have analog sticks. And while it can't track individual fingers, it can sense finger positioning. So it's not like... It's not like going back to PlayStation VR 1, but it's not quite up to scratch mm-hmm. with the most advanced VR that you can get now. Um, and then, as I said, the, the resistive triggers. So on the dual Yeah, sense, you can do some cool stuff with those triggers, I bet. Yeah, and for VR especially, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then it also has a USB Type-C connection between the console and the headset. Now that USB-C port on the front of the PlayStation 5 is starting to make a little bit more sense. Yeah, not just a place to plug your, your controller in to yeah, charge it. It was there for PlayStation VR all along. Yeah. Which is pretty Although fun. it does make me, you know, it's like, whoa. I mean, I guess it's a, that's a pretty good breakaway position. Yeah. But I just have, I have visions of accidentally Ripping pulling the system off. Screwing the, up the, po- the port in the front. Not that. Well, yeah, because well, yeah, you do have a uh, USB set. But I'll, like, oh, it just, it didn't quite pull out and the system fell over kind of that. Yeah, I was like. Yeah, that's yeah, real. It's, I mean, it probably won't. I mean, I'm sure the core will be long enough to avoid that, really. But yep. I don't know. You have nightmare scenarios in your head. Um, yeah. The other thing, of course, I'm concerned about is like, holy shit, this is going to be expensive. Like, this is going to be a very pricey unit. I mean, Quest 2 is 300 but yeah. that's that's Facebook taking a huge loss, you know? Yeah. I don't know if PlayStation and it's, is And it's lesser that. hardware, and it's wireless. I mean, and it's, it's wireless. wireless. You're, you're... This has one cord, but still, it has a cord. That makes a big yeah. difference. I mean, Zuck, was it Zuckerberg, like, last week or the week before, that basically said, like, he doesn't think wired VR is ever going to take off in any appreciable way? He did, yeah. And I kind of agree with I him. I do, too. Um, I mean, I, up I am very interested in this just because of the foveated rendering thing and how high resolution it is. Like you've, you've got my attention. I don't think I am very indicative of the mass audience in that yeah. regard. I, I think the I'm price is going to be terrifying on this thing. And while they've, they still haven't shown any photos of the actual helmet, we do have like patent images that, you know, kind of show what it is. And it's interesting to looking through this because one of these patents right there shows foveated rendering. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's right there and, all along and we've right had these patent images for months and months and now like it was there all along which yeah. is interesting well i mean to be fair uh just because it's in the patent doesn't mean it's going to end up in the product right right but so. we could have had a clue that that would be a feature yeah. that was going to be in it yeah and uh yeah so that's pretty much still all we have the word is that it is going to be available not in 2021, and that's pretty much mm-hmm. all we have. They haven't said it's definitely 2022. They just said not 2021. Um, Matthew, you think this is going to be successful? And if for what price does it need to come in at for it to have a chance? Um, no, and I don't think it matters. Yeah, because no. Yeah. <laughs> so they. Like, I'm up sure selling. it'll be fine. It's not like it's going to sell nothing, but like, yeah. I don't. I mean, you're. Sony seems to be leaning into the boutique VR idea, and I don't think that's where the future is in terms of breakout sales. I mean, if they're gonna if they're gonna like manage expectations in a Yakuza style, like maybe it would be successful for what they're trying to do. But when was the last time Sony did that? How do you? Here's my question, Matt. How do you convince someone to buy this instead of Oculus Quest Two? Because let's uh, it's be honest, gotta be software. There's no way it's gonna be less than three hundred bucks. No way. Oh, God, it's gonna, I don't think it's going to be less than 500 I, I tend to agree with you. So it's going to be more expensive than Oculus Quest mm-hmm. 2. It is going to be tethered, and you need a $550 PlayStation 5 to use it. Right. I, 
I, I just think it's a it terrible has to be software. Idea. There has to be stuff on this you can't play elsewhere, and you have to play. And Matt, I don't trust. No other way around it. Do you trust PlayStation to supply it with software? I sure the hell don't. I mean, we've lived through their handhelds. We've lived through the first PSVR. I think we know how this goes. Yeah, it goes just like the first PlayStation VR did, and the Vita did, and the PSP did. It gets supported for the first like eighteen months. They realize they don't sell a ton of software, and then they slowly start bailing on it, and they start leaning on third parties to support it. I mean, yep. that's the PlayStation way with stuff like this. And, and it's then you, gonna get, an, you get an Iron Man game that takes forever to load three years later, and that's the end. Yeah. It, I just have very little faith in this. I really – I admire PlayStation for trying to do this. Like, the fact that it didn't give up – and look, the first PlayStation VR, the last figures we got were 5 million sold, and that was – at the end of 2019. So my guess is they end up selling 6 million. I would, mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty safe bet. I mean, the amount of R&D, cash outlay, and work to sell 6 million units of anything, I just, I don't know, Matt. I think it's a terrible idea. I don't know why PlayStation's doing it. I don't get it. I don't know. I mean, I, I get it in a sense that, like, you don't want a separate unit like you don't want a separate pillar that is not tied to your console uh if you're sony uh it's just that i feel like that's not the direction this is breaking that's not the way the world's going right now i feel like they they're trapped like they designed sort this of, two I've, years I ago think before the quest 2 came out and now they're like crap I think internally they don't they're not that aware. I think internally they believe they can change the course. They can make a better one, one yeah, that more and people, people want. and people will come to to people will flock to the better item. But that is in better, their though? own in their own experience of success that is not how it not works. How it works. I know. I don't know. Their early mean. successes with the PlayStation 1 and 2, they were the weakest systems on the market, but they still won because they were the more attractive, more convenient, more affordable options. I mean, I'll just put it to you this way, Matt. If I ever buy VR again, it's not going to be PlayStation VR. It's going to be Oculus mm -hmm. Quest. It just is. And I think most people feel that way. My casual friends in central Pennsylvania have almost all bought Oculus Quest 2. Like, one yeah, of them I got mean, think... it. Another one went over to his house and tried it. They went on Facebook, and they had a little conversation about it on Facebook, and everybody went and bought it. Everyone in my yeah, circle I mean, of friends I, there. I mean, I think that's that's the trend. I will never buy an Oculus, probably. Um, I have zero interest in a in a system that ties my account to the Facebook account. Yeah. Um, especially that. with how wonky they are about managing that and how like yeah. weird the weird. I just don't have any interest. It's too underpowered for me. I, I definitely agree that wireless is the future, but not yet. Like I mean, that's Matt, too weak to me. This new PlayStation VR is only slightly more, or it only has a slightly higher resolution than Oculus Quest Two. Mm -hmm. I but think the Oculus power, Quest 2 but compares the power is, with is, this. But the power is going to be there. Yeah. That's the difference. It, yeah, you're um, right. Absolutely. It's uh, yeah, it's going to have stuff. It's going to be able to run stuff that was worthy of that re resolution. Let's put it that way. That's true. But is there anything going to be worth playing? Like that, you know, there. This thing. I mean, I'm halfway interested in this thing. Um, like the price scares me. But like, what you're saying there, appealing. Uh, you're going to need to show me some software. Yeah. Like some real killer software. And I the problem is, is have a hard time that. believing that's going to exist. They did that when they first announced the first PlayStation VR. Like if you just looked at the first like month of marketing for that thing, it mm -hmm. looked like it was going to be amazing. You're like, wow, really? They have this many games coming. And then they all ended up getting delayed and delayed. And half of them ended up being canceled or... They came out Gollum and were what they out? were supposed to be like. Did Golem ever even come out? That's what I just said. Did Golem oh. ever come out? I don't know. Like, I, I don't think remember actually if that it was did. ever a thing. I think it finally did. But it wasn't, yeah, I feel like it did. I think, yeah. it, I think so. But I think it would be, was a shadow of what it was supposed to originally be. And that happened with a lot of games for PlayStation VR. So It yeah. came out in 2019. I would not be saving your money for PlayStation <laughs> VR 2. I will just put it to you that the way. The fact that we didn't even know that is... Says I something. Kind of knew that it would come out, but I also remember. I, I suspected, but I just, yeah, I couldn't <laughs> exactly. remember. Exactly, but that was three years later, Matt. After it had been announced, like it yeah. lost all its thunder by then. It just, I think at this point, something like VR, you're probably better off leaving it to the people who are just doing VR. I don't know. 
maybe that's just me. Yeah, but. I mean, I, 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 I have a feeling that this is going to be the thing that teaches Sony to stay out. You know, Sony seems to have to fail twice <laughs> right. before they realize to stay You're out. Right. Of the, with handhelds. Yeah. The first the PSP, then the Vita, and it may be the same pattern too. Like, cause look, the PSP did pretty well, and then the Vita cratered. PlayStation VR one relatively did pretty well. PlayStation VR two might crater. So you're right. It does seem like PlayStation has to fail twice before it kind of, at least it doesn't wait three times, I guess. <laughs> one, one thing I did not know, um, like this seems to have been somewhat scrubbed from the internet. Um, Marty O'Donnell did the music for Gollum. Oh, really? And uh, in 2016, he launched a Kickstarter campaign to crowdfund a musical prequel to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The source for that on Wikipedia goes nowhere, uh, so I'm guessing that that, that doesn't it didn't work didn't out. exist anymore. It didn't work yeah. out. I, I, I don't I don't know if that's coming to Broadway near you out. <laughs> at all. <laughs> hmm. So anyway, that's the latest on PlayStation VR 2 or whatever they end up calling it, PlayStation VR for PS5. Again, I would not be like putting away pennies, like trying to save up for it. Um, I, I'm taking a major wait and see on this, Matt. Like, waiting, like, two years after it's on the market before I pull the trigger on it till I see what's really going to happen with it. Because last gen, the thing I feel most burnt on of anything I spent money on in video games was PlayStation VR. Also, my biggest regret as someone who hosts a podcast about video games from last generation was recommending PlayStation VR. So my ass mm -hmm. is sitting on the sidelines this time. And why won't you guys join me <laughs> in my bliss? Uh, all right. It's time for some Q&A if you guys have any. Uh, let's see. Yep, you guys were already in here asking some questions. Um, let's see. Commander Fett, it's going to be five ninety nine. He says, ha, ha, but... I don't know if that's really a joke. It might really be five ninety nine. No, I could see that. I could see that happening. I could too. Uh, Mark Simpson UK with the success of the Peloton brand. Funny, that's so funny that you brought that up. As I was pulling out to come here today to the studio, somebody in my building was getting a Peloton. And Matt, I didn't realize that they have like their own fleet of trucks. Like, yep. and there were two. They had two trucks there to deliver one Peloton, but they have their own like panel trucks with their branding all over them. I was like, mm -hmm. damn, I didn't realize it was that big hey, a deal. Paying $2,000 for an exercise bike, you're going to want to. They better the, come the, with the, the, white, the white glove, glove treatment. Yeah. Well, he says the success of Peloton, but man, they just like killed some child and they're being like, they had to recall all their treadmills. Um, internet linked keep. Fit equipment and programs. Does the disappearance of Connect from the Xbox lineup, even as a peripheral, seem like a mistake or a missed opportunity? Huh. No. No. <laughs> overall, no. But I do feel like they could have made a lot of money over the last like fourteen months during the pandemic when all the gyms eh, were closed. I think the 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 advantage of the Peloton style thing is that you have a dedicated device that has all the exercise like equipment like already there, like. Part of the problem with the connect I the, idea. The thing with Peloton is that you have a person who leads you. Yeah, but like the but you're getting you have a dedicated item that you then get on the exercise bike and do your thing. Like the appeal of it is it's just there's a it exists in a place in your house or your apartment, and that is where you do your workout. Uh the problem with stuff like the connect thing doing the equivalent is that you have to usually rearrange the room. Um, the advantage of the of a Peloton or an, a dedicated piece of exercise equipment in that regard, granted, it doesn't work for anybody, everybody. But the advantage is you there's no setup; you just get on it and do it. Like with the with the Connect stuff, it's too easy to just be like, I don't want to move the coffee table. Yeah. We're not gonna, I'm not going to do that now. Yeah. That was the problem it ran into is as a fun device, let alone an exercise device. Ring Fit Adventure um, has continued to sell very well during the pandemic. Well, Ring Fit again doesn't require much setup. Yeah. Like you know, I, when I use it, I wouldn't move. I I, I wouldn't move my my coffee. I would just get behind my couch, and that was good enough. Yeah. Like it, it because of the because the 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 pro the the what you call it joy cons because the joy cons like don't necessarily need to be in sight of the switch. Um, you know, they, they're all self contained like you know gyros. Mm -hmm. Like if I had to do that, you know, if they make you lie down and do leg stuff or whatever. If I did that and I was behind the couch, it was fine because it still knew where the controllers were. Like I, I didn't need line of sight, um, so that still worked. Like that was the problem. I mean, the real um, problem is that Connect was crap. Like it didn't work too. the way it was supposed to. So 
look, if they had maybe launched a better camera that did what Connect was supposed to do better than Connect did, then mm-hmm. maybe. But yeah, this and is I too still, much of a I, hassle. I and, still maintain that like. Uh, trying to make the device multi-purpose is sort of is the obstacle you're running into there like the you know to some degree people want you know their workouts to be in this place and their fun to be in this place and you don't need to do two things yeah. um and you can the peloton stuff is adaptable to the point that like and they're so focused on it that's the other thing is like i have a hard time believing that whatever like workout thing that microsoft would have come up with would have been as full featured as what peloton has um Frankly, I just wouldn't want to compete in that space right now. I wouldn't either. Yep. Peri- the peripheral space is expensive and risky. I mean, just look at all the peripheral companies that made like mm. the guitars for Guitar Hero. They're all out of business now. Like all yeah. of them. And let's not forget that the major lesson of the Xbox One was just do games. Yeah. Just focus on games. Yeah. Like, doesn't need to be a set top box. Doesn't need to do ESPN. Doesn't need to do all this extra shit. Just give me some games. And they're still trying to do that. They're still working on giving us some games. We're still in this weird limbo where Microsoft torpedoed their own ability to produce stuff and they're just getting back on their feet there. So yeah, I, I don't think the Connect, I don't think any lost potential from the Connect was worth uh, what it took to refocus Microsoft on what the Xbox needs to be. Uh, next from El Guapo, 3385. Any thoughts on Sony's partnership with Discord? None. <laughs> like, mm. I don't understand what kind of impact it would have that's really relevant to games or players. I I don't know why Sony's doing it because to me, I don't understand what it stands to gain from it. I just, it's one of those things where you're just like, why? Maybe there's some master plan that I can't see. Um, but as of right now, it just is like a blip on the radar. I don't even understand why it's happening. You have any insight on that, Matt? Nope. Yeah, me either. I have no idea. Uh, Eth Demon, how damaging do you think the Epic versus Apple trial has been for Epic to the rest of the games industry? All the video games industry dirty laundry is being put in public. Um, I don't think it's been damaging to Epic in a lot of ways because I think a lot of people have seen, if they haven't worked with Epic yet on Epic Game Store, that they're very generous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that they're paying these publishers and developers a lot of money. Uh, and I think for most people working in the industry, they've looked at that data as, you know, we talked about it extensively last week, and they've looked at that data and they said, wow, okay, Epic's actually bending over backwards to help the games industry. So I think for the most part, and I honestly, like, I think probably most developers and publishers as well are probably on the side of Epic because they also have to pay the 30% cut. So I think no matter what, you know, the, if you're a developer or a publisher, you're probably rooting for Epic because you want a 12% cut instead of 30% cut. So mm-hmm. all the dirty laundry that's airing out there, they won't care about that anywhere near as much as if Epic ends up winning and the cut drops to like 12 or 15%. So, yeah, I don't think anyone's like, oh, my gosh, Epic, your skirt's showing or anything like that. I think they're like, that's the crappy part. But look, Epic knew this. It knew it was going to happen. When it decided it was going to take it to court, it knew all this was going to come out. And Epic's very smart, as we all know. And if they're okay with it, then everyone else should probably be okay with it. That's my stance. Uh, We'll take one more because we're running out of time. Thank you, Jay Reed Vic, for Twitch Prime. Uh, Because you did that, we'll answer your question. With all the notable departures like Onosan from Capcom, Rod Ferguson from Microsoft, and now Jeff Kaplan from Blizzard. That was actually a surprise, man. Mm -hmm. He was like Mr. Overwatch, and he's gone. Is this the biggest sea change, exodus of major devs you can recall, or just the latest? It's just the latest. Yeah, it's just the latest. We were just talking Uh, earlier about Ken Lobb, and how he was a Nintendo icon. I mean, literally a Nintendo icon. He was in Nintendo Power Magazine every month. He was the one doing all the interviews with publications back then. He was the forward-facing person at E3 that, like, you did interviews with because Nintendo Japan, you know, they didn't have translators and didn't want to do interviews. That was a big deal. And that stuff has been happening all along. I mean, it's there's just constant turnover. Reggie. Who would have thought Reggie would ever leave Nintendo? And one day, mm-hmm. you wake up, and Reggie left Nintendo. So it's just the nature of the beast. And it's not just games. It's just the industry in general. You have these people who – and I was never this way, Matt. Like, I – I was a VP at Viacom, and I wasn't like, okay, I'm VP now, and within 18 months, I want to be SVP, and with 18 months of that, I want to be CEO. Like, I never had, like, that thirst 
to climb the corporate ladder. Because you get to a certain point in corporate America and you have like a reckoning. You realize that there's all this messed up crap that you have to deal with in upper management. And you have to make a decision like, do I want to get into worse than this? And like, I made the decision of like, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, fine. I'm not going to push for it. But there are people who their whole goal is I'm a VP. Now I need an 18 months. I need to become an SVP or I'm falling completely off track with what I'm trying to do here. Like, there, a lot of people are executives like that are executives in the mm-hmm. games industry. And so to expect there's people that, that just do not have like they, you know, they, you're chasing the car and one day you'll catch the car and you don't know what to do with it kind right. of thing. Um, we, I mean, we knew people like that, Yeah, you know, through all that stuff. It's almost like the, was it, uh, was it Elon Musk said something like this week or so where he said something like, oh, oh, like everyone says like, like I have it so easy, but they're not the ones working like you know, 50 hours a day, like six, you know, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. And it's like, dude, you're the richest person on the planet. Quit. Like just, you, you can take a weekend off. I promise. Like that's all they have. Yeah, I mean, he won capitalism, but they have nothing else in their lives. They become yeah. hollow and they live for their work. And I could see that. And I never wanted to be that. Some people see that and they're like, that's me. And that's what I want to do. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about people that like get, feel like they get creative fulfillment out of running meetings. It's right. Very, it's really disturbing. <laughs> it is. It's a different way of looking at your job, a different way of looking at life. I've always been the guy mm-hmm. who's like, I want to do a job that I really like. And if I make enough money to survive and have a couple of the things that I'd really like to have, I'm cool. Like, I've, I've never been the guy that thirsted for, like, more money or power. But there's a lot of people like that. And truth be told, there are a lot of them in the games industry. So there's going to continue to be turnover. There always has been turnover. And that's just the way it is. It's just the way it's going to be, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe not unfortunately. Some people were probably happy that some of these people go away. You know, some people may not be fans of Reggie. Um, Pactor's not. Like, he didn't shed any tears when Reggie left. Like, he's like, I felt like they could have had a better leader. So it all depends on your perspective on whether you actually care whether these people come or go or not. But, yeah, uh, inevitably, when you're talking about an industry that generates this kind of money, and it's only getting bigger, it's not getting smaller, uh, you're going to have a lot of turnover in leadership positions, and that's just the way it is. So anything else to add there, Matt? Not really. Okay. I, 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 unless they decide to form a super group, I don't think it's going to be a real <laughs> too, too consequential. It does make me a little concerned about Overwatch's future, but. Yeah, I mean, that guy, I don't know if he worked on the game all that much, but he was a guy who hosted all their developer docs and he started yeah, the game I, very well. It's just weird and... how Overwatch used to be sort of this ubiquitous thing and now it's something I have to like look up to see if it's still going. Yeah, well. They're going to show a big chunk of gameplay from Overwatch 2 here soon, so yeah, should about kind time. Of stoke the flames a little bit. All right, that's going to do it for Game Face episode 255, another episode that we went over, but we love you people, and it's worth every minute that we do the show. Um, a reminder, on Friday, three-night weekend with Frank O'Connor, the godfather, not the godfather, but the shepherd of the Halo franchise for the last 17 years will be on the show. And then don't forget, do not forget... On Saturday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, it's Ask Shane Anything, recorded live with our patrons who pledge $7 or more per month. If you're not there yet, you can jump over there and bump up your pledge and be a part of the show on Saturday. Please put something in your calendar and show up, because without you, there is no show. Uh, Let's see. If you're listening to Game Face... If you know show, there's no show. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) If you're listening to Game Face on Spotify or iHeartRadio or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or you're watching the show on YouTube, would really be awesome if you go to patreon.com slash sifted, that's S-I-F-T-D, and drop us a pledge. For just $4 a month, you get all our content early. Matt, I've realized of late that every other Patreon is $5. But... Mm -hmm. I'm perplexed on how you bump it up that dollar. Because we have not increased our price since we launched our Patreon like two and a half years ago. So I'm thinking about like bumping it up. But I don't know how you do that without losing everybody. Because it seems like they would have to consciously go and then repledge at that higher amount. It wouldn't just automatically, and I wouldn't want it to, just automatically bump everybody up an extra dollar a month. Like, I don't understand how that works on Patreon, but obviously it does somehow because people have done it. They've gone from four to five without any problems. So anyway, it's just something I'm looking into right now. 
Um, we are lower than literally everyone else on Patreon at this point. So just looking into it. But for right now, you can pledge at $4 a month and get all our content early. And then if you pledge higher than that, you get special perks and rewards like being a part of Ask Shane Anything. Um, if you want to find Sifted on Twitter, which you might if you're just watching or listening for free to know when the stuff goes up for free, you can find it at Sifted Games on Twitter. You can find me at Dinfire on Twitter. And you can find Matt at M. Kyle. That's M-K-E-I-L on Twitter. Thanks to everybody who was in the chat. Sorry we didn't get to all your questions. I see there's a ton of them down here. Actually, there's a whole lot that we didn't get to. Uh, Glottis021, thank you for Twitch Prime coming in at the last minute there and getting it in. Uh, apologize for not being able to answer all your questions, but hopefully that will just mean that you'll come back next week. We're here every Tuesday at twitch.tv slash siftedgames at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Until then, on behalf of Matt, I'm Shane. We'll see you next week. Game Face is up and out.